This episode of the Pay and Game podcast is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is a virtual private network that allows you to access content anywhere in the world. You can unblock websites that ordinarily you wouldn't be able to see, and it encrypts your data to give you some protection out there on the internet. Christmas is coming up. Sometimes you might just want to watch a Christmas special from another country. Well, now you can. Jump on the old Netflix if you want. Switch it from UK to America or America to Spain and enjoy the ride on Santa's sleigh. And this couldn't come at a better time, really, because Surfshock have got a very festive deal. Oh, yeah. Christmas is about giving. Use my link in the description below and use the code Jordy to get 83% off and four months extra for free. And if you are unhappy, Surfshock offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. So sign up now, use my code, and Merry Christmas. But for now, enjoy the podcast. At one time, I was homeless. Instead of going home every night, there was no home to go to. Life at home was very difficult. I grew up being abused. I lost my belt. I lost respect. I embarrassed my family. My vision was pretty much non-existent. I was able to just about scrape by the medicals. I come out, I have supreme confidence, and I'm scared to death. And I'm afraid of everything. I didn't care about living, I just wanted to die. I got up and I felt the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. I knew I was going to make a comeback. Fighting, this was designed for me. This is what makes us who we are. I'm the who the fuck is that? I'm so far ahead of this game. My dream, my vision for myself is to be the greatest martial artist to ever live. I have always been a fighter. There is nothing I do better in this life than fighting. There ain't never been a man that could better me. I was born to do this. Nobody can get close. I'm the best fighter in the world. I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion that's ever been. Sorry for the delay. My wardrobe department uh, caught a little problem. Uh, and it's good to have a big production team here. You know, thank God for them. And they saw that my shirt was wet and sent me uh, back to wardrobe uh, to get fixed up for you guys. So. Have, they, have they done your makeup as well, Teddy? No makeup, because that's the one thing I made a concession on, that there's no makeup in the world that can help on um, this particular guy. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we have a tight budget, so we try to save. You know, we don't want to waste money. Teddy, uh, my name's Brian. I'm a podcaster in the UK who happens to be a huge fan of you. Um, Appreciate it. I... I've gone on a bit of a journey learning about boxing. Uh, I've always been a fan, but I really started to get into it um, a lot in terms of the technical sides of it. And I find you help me more than anyone understand boxing and your knowledge from the past. Uh, you've got so much experience and uh, real, um, you know, real great stories, and you tell them like nobody else can. Um, so I've really wanted to interview you for a long time, mate. So thank you for the time today. Well, thank you for those words. It means a lot to me. No um, problem. Appreciate and, that very much. And I think it's great that a man uh, who started a YouTube channel uh, later on in life is having a lot of success. It's uh, great to see. Well, it's better than not having success. So I, I feel very blessed and very appreciative to people like you and the many people out there that have helped us be successful. Well, honestly, uh, this is an honor. You know, you're, you you are boxing to me. You are you clearly lived and breathed it your entire life, or the best part of your life. I th it was funny because um, the other night when Camboso won his uh, his big match, and afterwards he said, "I thought of what Custom Auto said to Muhammad Ali in that um, hit him with a big right hand early on and get that respect." And uh, I thought of you straight away. I thought, I bet you Teddy's enjoying that there, that someone still remembers the old, the old school ways. Yeah, that caught my, <laughs> that caught my attention. Uh, I just did an interview with Ken Bosis, mm -hmm. uh, fine man, champion man, champion fighter. Mm. Um, they connect. They connect. They're not singular, usually. I told him, I said, you really perked my ears when I heard you uh, talk about my mentor. As soon as I heard that, I said, "Oh, this is, <laughs> this is, this is interesting," mm. and um, this is a smart man to search out that kind of information. Anything that can help you uh, in the arena that you're going in—a difficult arena, a very lonely arena, um, a very dangerous arena. Uh, 
an arena of many, many dimensions, mm -hmm. emotionally, spiritually, physically, technically. So good for him that he searched out that information to help him, and it did help him. Uh, if it didn't help him in a physical way, it helped him in a mental way, which is 75% of this business, because it helped him think of something that would work. It gave him confidence. You know, when you're out in that ocean of fear, because we're all in it, we're all in it. Some people don't admit it, but it's okay. Uh, they want to call it something else. They want to call it nervousness, butterflies. You know, you want to call it uh, anxiety. Fine, no problem. But it's fear. It's the world of fear. And it's who lives in it better <laughs> and who controls it better. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that ocean of such a thing, we all need a life raft. <laughs> we all need something to get us to land. And that was part of the something that got Mr. Camposos, who's now a world champion. That's part of what got him to land, mm -hmm. that he could believe in that. He could know that. He could understand that. And he could see it as something that was real, that was part proven of the history to work. of the sport. Yeah, proven to, uh, proven to work. Mm. There was a precedent for it. And Cuts always told me that world champions were geniuses. That was his genius. That's part of his genius, that Cuts is right, that he was able to not only search that out, not only discover something that could help him, but to understand that it could help him. Mm. And so that was part of what got him through his journey there. Like I said, it got my attention, and we talked about it on the, on the podcast, on the interview when we did it with him, where it was, it was perfect because it really matched up with why Cus gave that advice to the great Muhammad Ali when he was fighting the great George Foreman. Because Ali was supposed to have no chance. He was a 7-1 to underdog. Cambosis was a 13-1 to underdog. Mm -hmm. But Ali was supposed to have no... There was actually people that were in fear of his life that actually said you, you, could, you could get killed uh, fighting this monster, uh, you know, uh, that's just toppling buildings, toppling people. He's... Yeah. My grandson uh, always plays King Kong, and he he makes me Godzilla. So we're, he's four years old. <laughs> he, he's, I'm blessed. I got three grandchildren. He he he's he's my buddy. He doesn't even call me Papa anymore. He calls me Godzilla. I don't know how much longer that's going to last. I, I, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully there is an end to it. And so I'm familiar with that, with Godzilla and King Kong and all these great creatures. Foreman was all of them. I mean, Foreman was the boogeyman. He was supposed to have no chance. Foreman was bullying guys. Foreman was going to go right through guys and had gone right through the great Joe Frazier and other guys that were put in front of him. You know, he had just beaten the great Joe Frazier. This, I mean, obviously, Lopez had just beaten the great Lomachenko. Uh, there was a lot of similarities. And again, it was, he was just an afterthought. He was just a name. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was just, you know, a number. A number to the next victim. That's what he was supposed to be. So he, he needed a little something. And that little something, it really made perfect, perfect sense. Because what cuts his message to Foreman, I mean to Ali against Foreman, was, look, this guy doesn't respect you. Well, let's go to Lopez. Lopez said, I'm blowing him out in one round. That's not respectful. Okay, mm -hmm. so there it is. So, same thing. So, Cus had told Ali, look, this guy doesn't respect you. And he thinks he's just going to go in there and destroy you. And thinks that you're afraid of him, like everybody else, to a certain degree. You're probably going to flee from him, whatever. But it's, it's going to be... It's going to be easy work. At the same time, Lopez kind of represented a bully. You know, kind of like the bully. I see you after school, and I'm going to kick the crap out of you. And it ain't going to take me long. So very similar. And he had to send a message. And Cus said, you got to send a message to this guy. You got to go out there in the first round. You got to hit him. Go across the ring and hit him with a right hand. Let him know tonight's different. Tonight is not your night. Tonight... You are not in charge. I'm in charge. 
Things will not be the way they were in the past. I am here to win. I'm not here to survive. I'm not here to get a check. I'm here to win. Oh, my goodness. Cambosis sent that message. <laughs> oh, so succinctly, so beautifully, so strongly. And the message was well received. Certainly was. And uh, <laughs> he hit the deck. And um, I, I, for me personally, watching such a great performance, to know that that young Australian lad who was supposed to be another number had actually been a student and done his research and done his history work and used lessons that other great fighters have used. It just made me appreciate it even more. It, as it should. Yeah. As it speaks to the person you are, that you would appreciate. You would, you would appreciate such things, understand mm. such things. Mm. Go below the surface. So, so when, when I was researching your life, especially uh, uh, the early years, there were some surprises in there because you come across as such a good dude. You clearly want to help people because you've devoted so many years of your life to training and teaching students. Um, but early on in your life, you were not a good guy, or, or at least you weren't acting like a good guy. And uh, coming from a background where your father was a doctor, that really surprised me because uh, usually someone who comes out of a family where father's a doctor, the, the kids usually follow in those same footsteps, but you didn't, you seem to be on your own destiny in your own way. So what, what kind of happened there? We all search for things, you know, mm. and um, we're all on the lookout for something, you know, call it love, call it ex whatever. You don't have to be from the projects, you know. You don't have to be from poverty to be poor. Uh, you know, we, we, we draw up these images where it, it makes for good storytelling and, and it, listen, there's truth to it. But it becomes the poetic way. It becomes, you know, the, the reading way, the, the way of novels, the way of, again, stories, where the kid comes from the bottom of the bottom, the bottom of the barrel. You don't have to be in the bottom of the barrel to be in the bottom of the barrel. It, it, it's, what, it's what you feel like. It's what you feel you need. It's got nothing to do, really, with your surroundings. It's got to do internally with what is, what you feel, and what you don't have. You know, you could be in the greatest neighborhood in the world, and you could be starving for things. I didn't know any of this stuff. I'm not smart enough. But as you get older, you recognize things. If you got a half a brain in your head, and um, you start to understand things. When I was young, my father was the man. It wasn't Mickey Mantle, it wasn't Willie Mays, it wasn't, I loved Muhammad Ali. I lost $120 on him uh, when I was 12 years old in school <laughs> and I, I had to find a way to pay it back. <laughs> pay your debts! I learned that lesson. I learned that lesson when I was 12 years old. Pay your freaking debts or don't make a bet. And I found a way to do it. It wasn't easy. Those guys were my heroes. I didn't even know what a hero was. I had no idea. If you, if you, you'd, you'd have to put Webster's Dictionary in front of me, and I'd read it and say, "Oh, is that what it's supposed to be?" But I didn't feel. I didn't know what it was, except my father. And I again, I didn't relate it. I didn't um, internalize it and articulate it out to be. Oh, he's my hero. He was just a guy that was, he could do anything. He left early in the morning, he came home late at night, and he saved people. He made people that were broken and fractured, he made them whole. He went into the projects to deliver babies. He went to places that no other doctors went. And he didn't go there for money. He got paid but not like some of the other doctors. I mean, he half his cases during the course of the day might have been for free. I mean, he did house calls till he was 80. He didn't charge. Why did he do it? Because these people didn't even have the means to get to an emergency room. 
Back in those days, there was no Obamacare. There was no HMOs. There was none of that stuff. There was a clinic somewhere, probably not in the best neighborhood in the world, that, I hate to say it, you might be worse off when you left there or not better off. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, he went places that it was dangerous to go just to help people, to make them better without getting paid most of the time or a lot of the time. He built a hospital that had 22 beds in it so people could get proper hospital care that weren't getting it because they couldn't get it. They didn't have insurance. They didn't have those things didn't exist. They didn't have the money. And um, he absorbed the cost. The people that had money, uh, obviously that helped pay the bills and the rest of it he absorbed. My only way of being around my father was to go to the office or to go on house calls. So I did. That's what I did. Customato used to say, you know, you learn things through osmosis. Well, I think it's true. You learn things through a example. I felt things through osmosis with my father. I don't know if it's called empathy for, for people. I don't know what it's called, but... I, I felt something, and but more importantly, I felt that I needed to be around him, and I couldn't be around him that much. And as I got older, it took me to the wrong places. I'm making no damn excuses. Everything I did, I did. I was selfish. I was stupid. Um, I was all those things. When I say selfish, because I just wanted what I wanted. I wanted him to be around my father. I wanted him to be at the games. I wanted him to be, but he couldn't be. I was too stupid to understand that at that age. Too, way too dumb. Because he had other things to do that were a little more important. But not to me. And, you know, and that's part of the selfishness. But as a kid, that's what happens sometimes, I guess. And so I, in my infinite Wisdom, which of course I'm saying tongue in cheek, but <laughs> the genius that I was, I started to figure out as a, because I was going on house calls when I was nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, and even, even eight. So I started to figure out as I got older, as I became a teenager, and I wanted to be around, I started to figure out how you, how you could be around Dr. Atlas more, you know? Without, again, with, I didn't articulate this in my head and say, oh, consciously. But I realized later that to some degree that's what was happening. That I figured out that all the people that got his attention, because that was the mission. How do I get his attention? And then I figured out all the people that get his attention are the broken ones, the fractured ones, the injured ones, the messed up ones, <laughs> the sick ones. So... I got sick, I got fractured, I got messed up, I got lost. And you know, I went on this, I went on this journey, I found people to hang out with, to grow up with uh, in a tough area where some of them were looking for things too. And it gave me comfort, gave me the family, I want it, or I thought I need it. And it also gave me the purpose to be around dangerous things that could wind up getting me a house call <laughs> with Dr. Atlas, mm -hmm. so to speak. And um, I'm fighting in the streets. I'm doing some robberies. I hate to say it because I'm not proud of it, but... I do feel good about where I got. Customer once told me, Teddy, it don't matter. It doesn't matter how long it takes a guy to become champion or to get to that place, as long as he gets there. <laughs> as long as he gets there. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I go by. According to my family and some friends, I, I, I kind of got there. And I'm thankful. And... Everyone has a journey. I always tell fighters that are under my, my guide, I say, you know, 
there, yeah, but Teddy, I, I shouldn't have lost that fight. I should, I, I, now I'm not going to be. I said, everyone has a different journey. Your journey was to lose that fight so you could win the next one, the one that is going to get you there. But that's part of your journey. But why, Teddy? Why, why, why should I have had, get robbed or whatever it was? Because that is what's necessary for you. Not him, not somebody else, but for you to get what you need to get and to learn what you need to learn to get down the rest of the road of this journey. Mm-hmm. I, was, I remember one time going to a fight, a boxing match. I remember my coach, he was putting Vaseline on me and he put his hand on the back of my head and I kind of moved and he said, what's the matter? I said, nothing. And he looked, and I I had stitches in my head. He said, "What the frick is this?" <laughs> I said, "Ah, it's <laughs> it's nothing. It's uh, what do you mean it's nothing? You got freaking stitches in your head." You know, I had obviously gotten it on the street a few days earlier, and I wasn't living the right life, but I was still fighting. And then finally, it went to the place where those things wind up going. You either get killed or you're going to jail. You know. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not too many other places that's taken you. And uh, I got to the place where it looked like I was going to jail, and Kevin Rooney had already left the neighborhood and went up. He had just won the gloves in 1975. He went up state to train with the great custom model. And four months ahead of me, and I, I'm in trouble on the street, he, took, he went to Cuss and said, I want to bring my friend up here. And he said, who is he? He said, oh, he's a kid, Teddy Atlas. He's a, he's a fighter, but he's in trouble. And I'd like, to, I'd like to keep him up here. He's going to be going to trial. And I'd like to keep him up here. Is he, can you trust him? <laughs> you know, is he, he's not going to rob the TV sets or nothing, is he? And he said, no, uh, don't worry. And I got up there with Cuz. Cuz got involved in my life. He helped me. Um, you know, I, wow. I had no problem being there for, for other people. I had trouble understanding how to be there for myself. But I know I'm not alone in that world. Teddy, you, I've got a few questions about everything no, you've been sorry. telling me. Let, don't uh, don't ask me open ended questions like that because okay. no, you're I, great. Because, you're great <laughs> because I'm, I'm I just sort of, I try to get to the end of them. I'm sorry. absorbing it. I'm, I'm taking this all in. So the, a couple of things I, I was wondering. Um, I believe the picture behind you is your father. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, which shows the admiration and love that you have for him, and clearly, you know, maybe not getting. Uh, what you were wanting from him was part of the reason that drove you to do some of the things he did. I don't know if this is the right way to phrase it, but did you forgive him for the way you were feeling? Because obviously a child just wants their dad. And, uh, you know, sometimes working through that from personal experience can be quite tricky. I only think of one thing. Does he forgive me? Because I let him down. Mm. I'm a I'm a doctor's son. I'm not supposed to be on the front freaking page of, of some newspaper robbing somebody. Okay. Um. You know I'm not supposed to be. Uh, I'm not supposed to be coming to his office like I'm, like I'm some star, like I'm freaking. Uh, uh, <laughs> like I'm Mick Jagger and, and I'm walking in bleeding like a pig and with a friend and and I think I'm going to go to the front of the line because I just got hit with a tie iron <laughs> I'm going to go to the front of the line to get fixed up so I could go back outside and keep doing the, the crap I was doing and you know I hope I hope he forgives me because and and he understands that I got to the right place and that um you know, that I'm thankful because I remember that day when I walked in his office with a friend, you know, in the middle of the day fighting out in the street and, you know, you learn all things. I, I was getting my apprenticeship as a future trainer. I didn't know that because you, you, you learn, you, well, not just how to handle cuts, but you learn that people can be strong, but they can be weak. And the ones you think are strong could be the weakest. You know, here's a guy, I'm fighting three guys, right? And one has to hit me with a tie iron. That's not strong. <laughs> That's not strong. It's not. It's, it's not. 
And and it's just later on, I'm like, yeah, if I see a guy who's strong, he might be very weak. <laughs> he might be very weak. And I might have to make him stronger as a trainer. It really does. It teaches you things. Oh. So you don't know it. I mean, you just know you're getting freaking sutures put in your freaking skull. But when when I walked in that day, like thinking, you know, I, I'm special. I could go right to the front of the line because my father, you have to wait five hours to see Dr. Alice. That's how many patients he had, maybe six hours. So I, I go walking in, the patient, uh, the nurse says, oh my God, come on. And of course she's taking me in and he comes out of, I'm, <laughs> I'll never forget it. He walks out of one of his offices. You know, he has a bunch of rooms, one of the rooms. He walks out in the hallway. He sees me bleeding and without hesitation, he says, have him, go in the, have him go in the waiting room and wait like everyone else. <laughs> that'll put you, that'll sober you up, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You that know is what such I mean? a dad move, though, isn't it? It's like, yeah, you're going to yeah. get a lesson a day, boy. <laughs> yeah, and then the lesson wasn't over. Then when I finally get to, hey, listen, he still gave me the family discount um, <laughs> uh, break because I only waited <laughs> I only waited about two hours, so he did, so I still got the family break. But when when I finally got in there, and 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 she's shaving my that part of the head, you know, to get the sutures in there, and and then she's standing there with a needle of Novocaine. He looks at her, the poor woman. He looks at. Her, he says, "What's that for?" And she's like trembling. She's like, uh, "It's you know, it's for the." It's it's for the pain, and he says pain. He doesn't want that. If he's gonna live like this, he wants to know how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> and I and me, you know, you could imagine what I, I said. Yeah, I don't want that. What are you giving me that for? <laughs> you know, wow. because I'm embarrassed. I'm 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 embarrassed. I'm embarrassed in front of my hero. I don't know he's my hero, but I'm embarrassed in front of Willie Mays. I am. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't freaking want that. <laughs> what's, the, what's the matter with this lady? Wow. So uh, they're all lessons, but that's the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I, I just hope, I just hope he's up there, you know, and he forgives me and he, and he says, hey, you know, he's doing good. I'm running a foundation now, a charity foundation called the Dr. Atlas Foundation, 25 years. And what we do is we, you know, seven days a week, 365 a year, we help people that fall through the cracks. You know, it's, it's a mother with five kids and one of her kids gets sick and she, she has to miss work. And uh, next thing you know, she's behind on the rent and stuff and she's going to be put into a shelter. Shelters are not good around here. I hate to tell you, they, they can be very violent. And she's got to be put into a shelter. We step in and we'll pay the $3,000 for the rent and this and that uh, to get into a place uh, just temporarily. So we're, we're, you know, we're no heroes. But we get you from point A to point B, and we're stepping. We're paying now. That three thousand, it might as well be thirty thousand for these people we're talking about. That's mm -hmm. that's what, everything is relative. That's what counts. So, and and then she doesn't have to go, or we'll put a handicap ramp up, you know, or we'll 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 get a we'll pay for the cancer medication that that a, a poor family had a young kid with cancer and. The insurance paid for the paid for the surgery, which could have been enormous, enormous. But the way that again, joking around, infinite wisdom. Who the hell knows who comes up with these ideas? But the cancer medication that has to be bought once a month is not covered by the insurance, and it costs twelve hundred dollars a month. Guess what? Might as well be again twelve thousand a month. They can't pay it. We pay it, you know. And uh, they need to fly out of state. Uh, to get a treatment program that makes more sense for their, their you know, their sick child. We fly them out of state. Uh, we, we, we run a food pantry for people that, hey, they, they can't get enough food. Uh, so we run incentive programs in at-risk schools, dangerous schools, where the, yeah, it's dangerous. I mean, schools should not have metal detectors, all right? And so we go into these schools and we tell the kids, look, practical practical 
It was practical what my father did. He got in a car and he went to your house. It was practical. We, we tell him, if you improve your behavior, if you start caring, give a damn about who you are. That's the problem. They don't care who they are because of the way they're brought up and what they're not brought up with. And they don't have fathers. I mean, the truth is the truth. And if you try to avoid that truth, you can't get to the place you got to get to to help these kids. So we understand the truth. So we go in there, we tell them, look, if you start taking ownership over who you are, start caring who you are, and it shows in your behavior and controlling your behavior, we'll have, your teachers will watch you over the next month and a half, two months, whatever the marking period is, and they will put you on a list. And if you're on that list, we're coming back with 200 tickets to the, for the Yankee game, the Mets game, the Knicks, the Nets, whatever it is. And we got buses. We're going we're gonna to bring the buses to, and you're going to get shows, and you're going to go to the game. And you know what? It makes a difference. It does. Why? Why? First of all, they got nobody doing that, so that's number one why. And number two why, it gives them a reason to care about what they're doing to care about who they are. Mm-hmm. So we, so I hope my father sees that. I really do. I hope he sees that. And, you know, he could say, hey, knowing him, he'd get mad at me. You want to know why? He was such a humble guy. If you ever talked about him doing something special, you know what he would tell you? Nah, I didn't do anything. I didn't, that wasn't special. Yeah. That was just doing what you're supposed to do. Well, Teddy... Do you believe in magic? Yeah, Povetkin magic. Uh, yep. Mr. Well, Povetkin. no, but it works for all of us. And and just as it worked for Povetkin, you know, you're you're getting people talking about you and doing great things now. And for that reason, I'm sure your father is very, very proud, mate. And uh, I felt like when you were telling me about what you were lacking when you were a young guy, it was kind of that purpose that your father had. He had his purpose. He'd found that, but you just hadn't found your thing yet. And as you got older, um, boxing obviously was was that purpose. This was what your destiny was. And you mentioned earlier, uh, Customado brought you into his his circle, which uh, I don't know if you believe in fate, but it does. It, it felt like the perfect thing that happened to you because you've clearly taken so much from the great man. Can you tell me what it was like when you first met him and and what that was like? I never knew what it was like or what it was supposed to be like to meet a legend. <laughs> like, I didn't know what a hero was. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what a hero talked like. I didn't know what a hero looked like. I didn't know I was living with, but I was living with a hero, my father. But I didn't know how to describe it, how to articulate it, how to, you know, break it down. But I was just told that this guy was a legend. This guy. He fought the mob. He did that. He, he cha- you know, he went against the powers to be. He had the heavyweight champ of the world. When the heavyweight champ of the world, there was only one <laughs> instead of a hundred. And uh, <laughs> it, he was, you know, he to get the heavyweight champ, he had to take his own route. He had to figure it out. You know, he had to overcome so many obstacles and. You know, and he was a guy who would never get on a plane and never fly. And his cuss told me, he said, Teddy, I don't fly. Flying, flying is for the birds and for the angels, which I am neither. <laughs> and uh, so here's a man who, when, when he had a fight in Europe with, uh, you know, with Patterson or whatever, he, he would have to take a ship over there, a ship to get there. And then he isolated himself. He was, he had taken himself out of, out of the world, mm. and he was living in Catskill, you know, isolated from everything. No longer with the big times. Why do you think he did that? Different reasons. One, he had a bad breakup, so to speak, with the sport of boxing. Um, there was the Keith Alpha investigation where he was going up against the IPC who ran Madison Square Garden and Jim Norris and all these people that were at that time controlled by the gangsters, if you will. Mm. Um, you know, Frankie Cabo, Blinky Palermo. Frankie Cabo was known as Mr. Gray. And, you know, they, they ran to a 
great extent back in those days. They had a lot to do with the running of boxing and the running of who was going to fight for a title. Sometimes who's going to win it. And um, Cus upset that apple cart to a certain extent. I mean, as soon as he won the title with Patterson, when, when they knocked out Archie Moore, he, he made an announcement the next day that they would no longer fight IBC fighters. That meant mob control fighters. That's kind of what it meant. Mm. And and so... That's you know, a brave move. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to say he got chased out of the sport or he just walked out of the sport. Um, maybe a combination. But he left the sport. He went up to Catskill, New York, and he lived up there. He wound up, he had a deal with Jimmy Jacobs, who owned Big Fights Incorporated, was partners with Bill Caton, later on became the managers of Mike Tyson. And they, you know, they they paid the bills. And he was basically, I mean, he was in a, I mean, the truth is the truth. It's not a bad thing but the, to say what it was. I mean, he was in a bathroom for the first half of the day, usually, because there was no fighters up there. There was very few. And he was... um. He was on, you know, he was like this song the Beatles made, The Man on Top of the Hill. He was he was this great figure who had been great in his time and he was retired or semi-retired to the hills, mm. to the country. Did you feel sorry little... for him a little bit when, because... No, no, I didn't feel sorry. I just tried to understand him. I was yeah. like, this, here's, it's kind of like, Kevin Rooney, all my information was coming from my friend, Kevin Rooney, my childhood friend. And he's telling me he's a genius, he's this special man, and, and he's, you're going to learn so much from him. And, you know, he, he's the, you know, he, he's the wizard of Oz. And he's, he's this, and then I get up there and he's in a wardrobe. I, I mean, he's in a bathrobe at, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm like, where, this is the where, guy. Is, where is he? Uh, what do you mean, where is he? <laughs> so yeah so i had a lot of figuring out to do you know i i had i'm thinking jesus rooney's telling me all these things but the guy don't seem to be that guy but then with time i understood with time i understood his his wisdom his disconnect from the world his beliefs mm. but most of all his understanding of human nature and the human mind. I understood that. And also his complete devotion to the sport of boxing. Like he told me one day, you know, we, we got very close. He told me one day, he said, listen, Teddy, I be, before you get married, make sure you pick the right woman. And I said, yeah, of course, I, I understand. No, no, you don't understand. In this sport, you, it takes complete dedication. And the reason I never got married is I could never be honest and say I've given full dedication to another person when I knew that the person that came first in my life was boxing. How many people are going to tell you that? Mm. You know what I mean? How many people are going to you know, self-search themselves to, to understand that, that, that need for that commitment, that truth mm -hmm. to that? Um, not too many. Not too many. And, you know... It was funny because he <laughs> he would say to me, you know, when you're you know when you're older and you're you uh, you know whatever seventies that whatever you're older someday. Meanwhile, I'm an eighteen year old kid with him, nineteen year old kid. I can't even think of when I'm going to be twenty one where I could legally drink. So he's like, uh, you know, and you're doing this about and I'm and and you're training and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to be training fighters when I'm. <laughs> 70 years I cuts this you know I I didn't sign on I didn't sign on here for you know uh life and death the whole oh yes you did <laughs> oh yes you did I wonder oh, how yes, he knew that did. so at such an early age looking at you you know what he told me he put me in the gloves and I you know I, I won the gloves I was lucky I I, I was I won the gloves and I was a good. You punch. won the gold. Is this the golden gloves? Uh, thing yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I read up on that. And uh, so anyway, I win the gloves, or whatever. And then, but I had an injury. So long story short, he didn't let me overcome the injury. Now, I, it's got to be explained if I make a strong statement like that. I mean, we went to doctors, and of course, the best one was my father, and I had a problem. But 
that wasn't the end all to my career. Cuz said it was, but he wanted it to be. He was yeah. a genius. He he had nobody up there and he saw something according to him that I was a I was a born teacher. And and he said you can and he spent every day then trying to convince me to be a trainer. He said, "Listen, I got to pass this on. I got to mm-hmm. pass this on." And you, this is what this is what you're meant to be. You're a teacher. Yeah, you could have been a fighter, but you could have been a fighter. But that's 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 yesterday. Today, let's concentrate on being a teacher, being a trainer, where you can be part of other people's lives. You can help them get to their dreams, to their desires. And instead of being only part of your dream, you can be part of thousands of people, hundreds of people's dream, and help make that come true instead of just one. And you could be a person that has many titles with many people instead of just one. You know, he kept driving at home, driving at home, driving at home. And um, I guess it got home. I guess it took a while. Like somebody very wise once told me, you have plans for life and life has plans for you. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And it's true, things change. And a kid walked into the gym. You know, we we brought him in the gym. He was twelve years old. His name was Mike Tyson. You might have heard of him. <laughs> and uh, and it it changed things. You know, yep. four years after me training him, things happen, and me and Cus had to say goodbye to each mm-hmm. other. It was it was the destiny. It, it was it was it was the journey. We had no idea that was going to be the journey uh, at the time, but that was going to be the journey. Well, you created something amazing together. And if you are um, going to team up on a boxer, and it felt like, um, you know, Cus was uh, the the old wise head and you were sort of the, the one who had the energy to keep up with a Mike Tyson all day when, when I was watching some of those old sessions. That was destiny. It, it really did feel that way. And um, I guess one of the questions I'd like to ask you about Cus how do you think his words are so tattooed on your brain? Because, you know, even before we even started talking about him, you quoted him twice. And it's very rare that a human can leave a mark on people the way Cus did on so many people, not just you, but obviously Mike Tyson. And as someone who's never met the guy, it always fascinates me of how's this guy's words so powerful that they've stayed with people long after he's passed away? Well, he marked my life. I mean, he was a mark on my life. He was a <laughs> an influence on my life at at a particular time that I needed an influence on my life. That's the key. Mm. I'll tell you another thing. He was very good at talking and articulating things, Cuss. Mm. And my father was the opposite. He He could be brilliant at it, but he didn't talk. He just did. And what gets lost in the translation is that I'm taking nothing away from Cus, who I love, but I was angry at, mm. but I love, and I understand better now, because I was angry. He, you know, he he took the side of the fighter. Me and Cus were partners. I was training all his fighters. I mean, yep. when I got there, it was an empty gym, and we made it not empty anymore. And Cus would come just once a week, maybe once every two weeks, depending on how he felt, just to see what was going on. And he would give me what I needed, you know, like giving a lion uh, raw meat. He 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 gave me what I needed. He would he come in the gym. I'll never forget. He he wasn't there for two weeks. He walk in, and and we had nobody. Then we had ten kids, twenty kids, thirty kids, forty. And I got all these kids coming to the gym, and I'm develop. I'm you know, and I'm taking them down the Bronx to get fights, to get experience, and putting tournaments, and we're winning tournaments. And he would come in after a few weeks, and he say, "My God, Teddy Atlas is creating." fighters here champions you know and it would lift me up i could i could float i wasn't getting paid a dime <laughs> i wasn't getting paid a dime <laughs> I, I i couldn't even afford a cheeseburger some days and yet i felt rich i felt i felt rich like i said earlier you don't have to you don't have to be poor to be poor and you don't have to be rich to be rich and I, I could have floated out. I, I was like, oh, man. Yeah, look at what he's doing. He's creating champions. Look at this. 
And that's all I needed. But meanwhile, the guy behind the curtain who was paying fifty dollars, let's get it right. It wasn't, you know, five thousand. It was fifty measly dollars. Guess what? It wasn't measly in those days. It wasn't measly's back in the seventies. And he was paying my father was paying my rent and board fifty dollars a week, two hundred dollars a month. And without that I'm not there. And without that I'm not here. Wow. And and you know, and then talk about all the great things Cus said. And they were all right. And they were great. My father was doing them. You know, being a professional, Cus would say to me, being a pro, Teddy Atlas, remember this. It's doing what you said you were going to do. It's doing what you're committed to doing, no matter how you feel. You wake up, you're sick, you go to work. You wake up, you're thrown up, you have diarrhea, you go to work. You, somebody dies, you go to work. I mean, it, it got deep. It got deep. And you do your job. You're in a fight. You got a broken hand. You use the other hand. You, that's a professional. You, you do what's supposed to be done no matter how you feel. So he's telling me this. And who's doing it? My father. My father, when, it, when I was a kid, he would put a white pill under his tongue. I didn't know what it was. It was a nitroglycerin because his heart was skipping a beat. But he kept going. He kept going. He he had surgery when he was already in his seventies. And what does he do? He waits till my mother. Who does this? He waits till my mother goes away to Daytona Beach on a vacation, and he's alone. And he and this way he can plan his surgery that he has to get. And he gets the surgery, has somebody drive him down. He goes down to Philadelphia, gets the surgery, supposed to stay a few days, doesn't, lays in the back of the driver's car, comes back, and the next day he's in his office working on a couch because he's in too much pain to stand up, <laughs> taking care of his patients. And my mother don't know because she's down in Florida. That's why he waited. That's a professional. That's a professional. Call him a crazy man if you want. Fine. That's a professional. And so Cousins tell me all these things. And as time goes on, I'm saying, my father, my father, my father, mm -hmm. my father. <laughs> so it was a, it was a very, very strange and powerful set of uh, crossing over mm -hmm. of, of a mixture of different, just different alternate energies mm -hmm. and um, different alternate sources of, of wisdom and life that were coming to me. One was coming to me from this great custom model that was kind of drawing the picture mm -hmm. magnificently. Mm -hmm. But then the other one quietly in the background was coloring it in <laughs> every mm -hmm. day while you were sleeping so you wouldn't see him coloring it in. And then one day you go and you see this picture and you say, oh my God. Wow. It's so funny because... Um my, well, my mother passed away when I was younger, and the older I've gotten, the more I'm able to appreciate her because of the wiser I get, the more I'm able to reflect back on her life and look at it through a different lens almost and go, oh, now I understand. And, you, and it's nice to feel like you can still connect with the parent in a different way entirely, even when they're not here, um, through that maturity that you're gaining and through the bigger picture. And I totally understand what you're saying there, Teddy. And uh, the way you've described your father, what a guy, what a man your father was. Incredible. When you say that, I feel good. And it makes me connect to, to a saying from, from one of the cultures. They call a guy like that a mensch. I hear people say that to me once in a while. Mm. Your dad was a mensch. And you know... You don't have to really, again, you don't have to go to Webster's Dictionary and really define what mensch means. 
because when they connected to life, to action, to how a person lived, you get it. So when when somebody described, you know, a mensch, I understand my father, in my own private proud way, was a mensch because they described that as somebody who was strong. Mm-hmm. Somebody who found a way to keep his word when it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to keep. You know, to do what you said you were going to freaking do. Mm-hmm. My father, you know how many times my father wound up on a house call at 1 in the morning, 12 o'clock at night mm-hmm. uh, doing a house call? You know why? Because earlier in the day he told the patient he'd be there. But he couldn't get there because he had so many other patients until midnight, until 1 o'clock. But he got there. I'm on a house call with my father. And, you know, I'm nine years old, whatever the hell I am. And um, we're going down this road. And we, we never do two house calls uh, in a short period of time. So I noticed that it was the same house we had done, uh, I don't know, maybe a few days earlier, maybe a week earlier. And I was surprised. So I said, this person must be very sick. Well, it made sense because we're there. And he goes, no, actually, she's, she's pretty, very healthy pretty healthy for her age she's obviously she was very old and so we're pulling up and as we're pulling up i noticed it was cold out i noticed that uh, again it was a tough area a poor area but i noticed that this woman and she was an old woman she had come out with an overcoat over her and and she was outside so i thought oh my god she, she couldn't even wait inside like she's you know obviously waiting to see him and um so I said, well, if she's not, you know, if she's not sick, if she's not that sick, why are we here? And the rules, just so you know, he never told me this was a rule, but it was not professional for a son to go in the house or into the apartment um, for a house call. So I would always wait. In the, I never questioned it. I never tried to get out. I always understood somehow that you, you stayed in the car. But he would leave the keys there, and he would say, if it gets cold enough, you could start it up. <laughs> um, he's getting out, and there was a routine. He would get out of the car, and he would open the, the back door to get the doctor's bag because he didn't have one of these little tiny doctor bags. He had a big one. He had a big black doctor's bag that had a lot of stuff in it. And he, so he opens up the back door, and he's taking the doctor bag, and that's my chance to talk again. Real quick, I know the routine. So she, he just told me she's not that sick. So uh, then, then why, why are we here? Says she's lonely, and loneliness is a sickness. And he shut the door, and I had to wait till he got back from the house call to get the other answer. What do you do for somebody who's not sick, but they're lonely, and you say that's a sickness? You know. So what do you do? So he comes back in. He had a, my father didn't say much, but he had a great sense of humor. And, and he was one of those guys who could make fun of himself. <laughs> and he, and, and he, and make it sound pretty good. And he, so he comes back, he opens up the back door, he puts the bag in, he gets in the front door, and I'm waiting. And I say, so what do you, what, what do you do for her? And he says, I let her make me a cup of tea and I listen. And I listen and let her tell me what a great doctor I am. (laughs) 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 I'm I'm saying, oh, that's, that's what you do? Yeah. And then he told me later on, and I didn't understand it until I got older. He said, I give her a placebo. So I never understood. Later on, he told me, I give her sugar pills. And then, of course, I understood placebo, sugar pills. I got it. I understood. But that was the thing to me that made him, I don't know. I guess that's part of why I felt the way I felt. Here's a guy going out there doing an extra house call with a woman who doesn't really need medicine, doesn't need no antibiotics, but she needs somebody. Somebody to listen because she had no family. And that would have been in an era where things like mental health and depression weren't really 
fully understood to the way that they are today. So, you know, very he was obviously ahead of his his time in that regard. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned earlier uh, this 12-year-old kid comes into the boxing gym. The story of Mike Tyson and Cuss and your involvement is legendary. And uh, I went back and I, I looked up some of the footage of Mike Tyson at a, like a youth boxing tournament. And you're there with a little bit of facial hair and uh, and darker hair. And, and But Mike must have been about 15, but he looked massive for a 15-year-old. And he was dropping these kids like, uh, you know, flies. And um, what was really interesting was obviously now I know you as this big, passionate speaker. But with Mike, Mike was uh, crying before a main event very upset, very looking like he was just struggling in the moment, even though this was, you know, seemed easy for him. And you, the way you were talking to Mike, you were very quiet, you were very calm, you were very gentle with him. And, you know, when he won the fight, he leapt into your arms and hugged you and clear that the, there was a lot of love back then. And I just wondered sort of, well, what made you take that kind of approach with Mike and how 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 were you? with Mike in terms of coaching him and talking to him in that way was it always like that or did you change it or it was louder sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wasn't always uh, soft spoken it was louder it was what it needed to be mm. I'm not trying to make myself smart or I'm a professional trainer I'm supposed to know at that time of course I was training pros too even though I was a young kid but I'm um, I'm supposed to know what the hell I'm supposed to say at the at the right freaking time mm. with the who that person is. I, I'm supposed to know that, uh -huh. and I think I think I knew that. I mean, I don't get credit or, or medals for that, but or whatever doesn't. Uh, people say it's this that whatever, but I was I was doing what needed to be done at the time with that particular situation with that particular person, knowing what he needed, knowing where he was emotionally. Mm -hmm where he was mentally, you know, and that's what he needed. Something louder was not needed at that point. If it was, uh, you would have heard it. It was in other fights sometimes, but at that time he needed comfort, but he needed strong comfort. He needed understanding. He needed, he needed a partner mm. that was with him, that understood where he was and where he was going. And I needed to be that. I understood that. So I, I was that. You were perfect, actually. You were absolutely perfect. Uh, for a, uh, obviously, you were young back then. But obviously, we, it's easy to connect the dots now, looking back. But Mike, um, he looked like a bit of a tortured soul, even in the footage there. And the way you were calmly and gently handling him and keeping him cool before the violence, um, it was the perfect balance to what was clearly going on in this young man's head and then afterwards it shows you ringing cuss up going hey we broke a world uh, broke a new record cuss is delighted you're happy um and, and everything seemed so great a i was wondering what it was like watching the the birth of of the beast um in mike tyson but then why it went from him jumping into your arms and celebrating with you in those lovely moments to you guys not speaking anymore and you having to leave. What was it like to to be part of this, to see this phenomena, if you will, this protege, if you will, um, develop into this, into what everybody hopes they could get, a, a great fighter, a, a dominant fighter, a special fight even. The most honest answer I can give you is the one you probably wouldn't expect. I wasn't in a train seeing a countryside saying, wow, how beautiful this is. I was just driving the train, going to where we had to go. So it wasn't really a matter of me being able to, and I love to give myself credit and say, oh, boy, I saw everything ahead of time. And I was just doing my job day to day. My job was to take someone who was given to me my, that responsibility and make them into the best fight I could make them into. And I was doing that job. I was doing it piece by piece, brick by brick. It was like kind of like if you're a builder and you're building a house. I, I, I knew a, I saw a, 
a picture of what the house had to be. I, I understood that. But as I was putting those bricks down, laying those bricks day to day, you know, hot, cold out, hot out, whatever, and I'm laying those bricks and then putting a mortar in between to make sure those bricks stick. I, I, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't, you know, each inch of the way saying, oh, how it's getting closer to being this this beautiful piece of architect that it's you know being a the notre dame or it's be you know being something of the Colosseum that the romans built i wasn't i was just putting the bricks in the way i felt i needed to put them in and when every once in a while something shifted where i had to replace a brick i replaced a freaking brick to me if i made it more glamorous or more romantic or more credit to myself and seeing what was I, I was just seeing each day he got better at slipping a punch did he get better at getting away from a right hand <laughs> did he get better at closing the distance without getting hit uh did he get better at putting punches together did he be, get better at becoming a body puncher did he get a little calmer each day and more understanding of what i was teaching him that's that's where my focus was so when your focus is that and it was concentrated, and it was on all my fighters. That concentrated, that's, you don't have the privilege or the pleasure really to be saying, I'm developing the next greatest heavyweight of all time, or the next Joe Lewis, or the next Rocky Marciano. Or the, mm. I don't have the pleasure of that. I don't have the time for that. I don't, Is that because you can't allow that because you have to stay so focused on the process? Yeah, because nothing nothing is promised. It's, it's what you make happen and what you work at making happen. And uh, I got that from my father, again, not verbalized, mm. but osmosis. You know, uh, he, he didn't sit back and think of what a great doctor he was or the or how he's going to he he sat back and every day the phone rang and told him to do a house call he did a house call when when a, when a, when the sun came up in the morning he went to work and he went to work and you know uh, it wasn't preordained he went to work and figured it out when he was there that his job every day was to make somebody better and and to administer whatever needed to be administered as far as advice and medicine. I did the same thing. I was a professional box. I was a boxing trainer. I was not a trainer. Cuss would get mad at me. Cuss said, you're not a trainer. You're a teacher. All right, I was a teacher. And every day my job was to go in there and teach the next lesson. Eventually get to that place. Yeah, And then when you get to that place, then you can take a deep breath. Then you can sit back. Then you can say, whoa, that's pretty damn good. Wow. But you know what? I was taught the way through cuss and my father. It was funny. I didn't even get that much. I got pleasure. Don't get me wrong. But when we got to that place, it was like, okay, now how do we get to the next place? <laughs> so what was the, the, the place, the original moment, I guess, of... Because when I watched Mike Tyson footage when he was 14, 15, and he's hitting a heavy bag, like a, a, a phenom, you know, like nothing I've ever seen before in terms of power and speed, uh, was there a moment where it sort of... It hit you like, okay, world champion is coming here. This is going to happen. I don't know that I can tell you that, even though that seems like the thing I should be telling you. Because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should be smart enough to see that, right? But I was so consumed, I think, with getting to the next moment because because when we were knocking everyone out, um, at the end of the day, it was great. It was beautiful. But okay, the next thing for me was, gee, he threw too many headshots. He got to him, but he should have went to the body because he would have got to him 30 seconds earlier. <laughs> Because if he went to the body, yeah. he would have he wouldn't have wasted all those other headshots, which he got to him. But if he wastes those shots with a better fighter, he'll get caught in between. Them. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I is, got you. That, that's, you know, that, do, I don't know if you understand what. I, no, I do, I, I do. Like perfectionists and, and, and high achievers, I they, guess, they don't but, smell the roses. They're too focused on getting to the next step. And the next step was just the next step. Yeah, uh, that's all it was. It was just, uh, you know. Like when he was knocking everyone out, I remember, 
I felt pretty good. I came home. Cus, me and Cus would sit down. We'd go over it. And um, and he started, again, I'm there. You know, I'm not getting paid anything. But like Cus would re- remind me, he goes, you're going to college. And, this, and you're not paying for college. Even though my father was paying a little bit. But it was what it was. But he said, you're going to college. That's where you're going right now. You're going to college. You're going to school. And it's going to pay off for you. It's going to pay later. And, you know, okay, and so when we would when we would sit and talk, because I'd feel pretty good, but nothing beyond what I, just that, and I'd wait to hear it. And Cus would say to me, yeah, he looks good for three rounds, but can he do it for, for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, okay, get back to work. He didn't say that, but that, <laughs> that that's that's what it was. Like yeah. Teddy Teddy, don't go you know, don't go reading your, you know, premature um great reviews yet. The you know, can he do it can he do it for te- because that was always the goal. Can he do it for twelve rounds? Mm. Because that was always the goal. Can he do because consistency. Yeah, Teddy, he looks good for three, but he can can he do it for five, six? Uh, and the truth would come home to me. No, because I saw him when he when he can't, or or if he fights a real pro, a guy that he can't really catch clean, will he will he fall apart? Will will he start to deteriorate? Uh, yeah, I've seen signs of that. Okay, go back to work. Talk to you later. <laughs> you know that kind of thing, and yeah. you know that was kind of, it wasn't verbalized again, as I say, but it was understood. It was understood, and rightfully so. You know, you know how many times Cus would come. Again, he wouldn't come to the gym every day, but he'd come once in a while when he knew Tyson was sparring. He he would come, and so he'd come and he watch. And I was developing all kinds of fighters, big kids too, but nobody could handle Tyson. Not the kids. I mean, they because he would touch them, he would hurt them. I mean, that was the truth. You know, he was like one of those guys, Cuss, I love Cuss's descriptions. Cuss would say to me, Teddy, the old timers would say, you hit a guy, this guy hits so hard, he hits you on top of the head, he fractures your ankles. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and, and, you know, that was Tyson. He, that was him. He yep. did it to Burbick. He hit him on top of the head, he fractured his ankles. So... You know, I, I was developing these, these kids. I would sometimes let Tyson move with them and tell Tyson, you know, you have to control yourself. You know, you can't hit them hard. And meanwhile, he would touch them and, and he would still hurt them, you know. And, and he couldn't be trusted. And I'm not calling him a bad guy. You have to understand, it's my, you're, you're in my industry now. When I say you couldn't trust them, I don't mean that in a, in a way you think of necessarily when you say those words. I mean like, he didn't have the maturity mm. and the confidence and the discipline to truly hold back and still not get hit and still not let the guy take advantage of him. He didn't have that yet. It takes a certain maturity and confidence and seasoning to be able to go in there with a lesser fighter and not hurt him and work yep. with them without having to hurt him. So I, I, I was... I was in a conundrum, so we started figuring out things, and then finally, I remember I told Cus, I said, Cus, we gotta, <laughs> and it was a little crazy because the kid's 14 years old, 15 years old, we gotta pay somebody to spar with him, and Cus was like, yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's crazy, that's, that's like insane, but, you know, we said, yeah, <laughs> so, you know, and then in those moments when he was in there with men, and he was in there with more experienced guys, then it's like Cus also used to tell me. I give credit to people who tell me things. I don't try to, but I did learn a few things on my own also. But you know, and, and it's not just what you learn; it's where you take it. Like mm. Cus said, you're going to take what I gave you, and then you're going to take it to your own places. And eventually that happened. But I remember he used to say, Teddy. With a fighter, you want to check the the heating system. So I said, "All right, go ahead, Cus, give me the rest of it." Uh, and you got me. Go ahead. And he said, "Well, 
If you go into a house and you're going to buy a house, don't you want to make sure the pipes are good? Yes, yes. You don't want to find out after you sign the contract that uh, that there's holes in a pipe. No. All right. So you go in the house and the owners of the house want you to see it in prime condition. They put the heat on 70. What do you have to do, Teddy? I guess I got to put the heat on 90. Yes. Because then all of a sudden you see if it's good plumbing or not. Because if it's not, and this is Cuss's words. I, ding, 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 ding. Little, little, ding, <laughs> ding, ding. Little, little holes are going to start popping out and you're going to have problems and you're going to see the plumbing's not good. Same thing with a person. Same thing with a fighter. You want to put the heat high and see if there's, these holes start popping up. So yes. we put the heat higher and sure enough, he was right. I saw the holes popping up. There was There was no ting, 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 ting. But they were very obvious to a person if you knew what you were looking for and what you had to be looking for. So I'm in the, I'm watching, and uh, he's in there with a guy who can't catch a big shot. And what does Tyson start doing? A lot of people would have bypassed this and said it was the other guy's fault. But again, Cus wasn't paying me, so he had to give me something. So he gave me a nickname, the Young Master. Again, I could float right out of the freaking gym. I didn't have to get, it's like, it's like he just gave me 50,000. I'm the young master. I'm the young master. Holy crap. I'm the freaking young. Yeah, you're the broke young master that can't even buy a cheeseburger uh, if you get hungry. But that didn't matter. I was the young master. So I'm in there and he's like basically challenging me. Okay, young master, what do you see? And... Tyson's in there with this guy big and more developed, more mature. And what's Tyson doing? He's throwing bombs. He can't knock them out. They're being blocked. They're being slipped. He, he can't catch them the way he catches other guys. So what happens after one, two rounds? He starts p- grabbing on the inside. But he does it in, like Cus said, he does it in a clever way where he doesn't, he doesn't get blamed for it he puts his hands behind the guy this way he knows that most most people in there with a big puncher like him will take what you give them as a way out what do we mean by that when he put his hands behind you give an opportunity for the guy to either fight or grab most people will take the opportunity because they got a little weakness to grab. And as we would say, me and Cuss, make a solid agreement that if you don't hit me, I won't hit you. So now it's not just a matter of me teaching them how to slip, bang, bang, slip, bang, bang, throw back a punch quick. But now I have to understand how to make them better mentally, stronger. Otherwise, we just got a bunch of beautiful bricks put together, but we don't have the mortar, the cement to keep them in place. Mm. So I got to do that now. So I'm watching, and sure enough, he can't knock the guy out after one or two rounds. He puts his hands behind the guy on the inside where he should be punching. He should be finding ways to create openings, as I would always tell him. No. No. He puts his hands behind the guy where he can't use his hands. And what does the guy do? The guy takes a free ride. You're going to give him a free ride? He's going to take it. And he grabs the hands and he makes a silent agreement. The two of them. You don't hit me, I won't hit you. What do I do? Cuss is watching. I jump in the freaking ring. I jump in the ring. I slap his hands down. And I say, no, no silent agreements. No free rides. Drive your own freaking car. When we get home later on that night, Cus says, come over here and sit with me, young master. Again, he might as well have just, <laughs> might as well have just given me a gold Cadillac. Yeah. Because I just, that's what it was. And those were the lessons of that took place and needed to take place at that point more and more, more and more. Um, because that was the one weakness Tyson had yep. mentally. You know, he he. that was the one thing you couldn't give him. You, you could bring him to it and you could make him face it and teach it and explain it. But 
it, it wasn't like something that you could stand there all day and teach him the technique. It was something that he had to be part of and understanding of and agreement of. With, with Tyson, obviously, his uh, childhood being as tough as it was and um, is well documented. And even later on in life, obviously, he was seeing how difficult he's found things mentally. And then to put a, a person like that into superstardom, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, but I was wondering if when he was a young kid, could you see that pain and some of those issues occasionally spilling out? Because, you know, I've been in the boxing ring and uh, the emotions will come out, um, you know, in, in that ring especially. You saw weaknesses. You saw strength, power, quickness, speed. And you saw smartness, cerebralness, where he understood what you were teaching him and he could put it to use. And you saw good instincts. He understood what to do in certain moments or what instinctually somebody else was feeling. I remember one time in an amateur fight, we were in a hallway. It was for the regionals to go to the nationals. So it was a big tournament. And we are in a hallway, and he sees that his opponent is in a hallway now in front of him. And instinctually, what does he do? Genius! genius, as Cus would say. He goes over and I'm watching him. Usually this wouldn't have been noticed, but I'm watching him every second. And he goes over and he feels the wall. I said, what the fuck is he doing? And I could see, nobody else sees it, but I see he's feeling the wall and he tapped it. And then I said, oh my God, I know what he's doing. He's, 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 not, he's not trying to be a laborer, but he's feeling to see how hard and solid the wall is. Is it concrete or is it just plasterboard? <laughs> so now I'm watching him. I said, this son of a gun. I, I know what he's going to do. So he's there. He's shadow boxing, right? And he waits till the other kid's looking. And through the corner, you know how you could the corner of the, uh, your eyes, you could see if somebody's looking without them seeing that you're looking. Well, so he does that. And... He sees he's looking. He goes over to the wall. Bang! He punches right through the wall. <laughs> I said, oh my God, this fight's over. <laughs> he just ended this fight. <laughs> this fight's over. The kid the kid looks sick, the poor kid. He looked like, like if somebody's getting sick next to you on an airplane, you got to give him that airbag. <laughs> I mean, it's like he needed the airbag. I mean, he needed that to throw up in. And I'm, I almost felt sorry for the kid. And uh, he, you know, he went in there and he dispatched of the kid. Well, what was left of him? Mm. What was that? I told Custer so he goes, genius, genius. He goes, but now you got a tougher problem. I said, a tougher problem? You just told me I got a genius on my hands. He goes, nah, nah, nah. It's your job. You got a tougher partner. What is that? You got to get him out of the habit of depending on someone else being weak for him to be strong. That's your job the rest of the way. And that was my job. So to, to your question, what was it like? I would look and i say, wow, that's... Uh, I remember this, I'm saying this saying with cuss. Punches are born, they're not made. No matter how you improve them, you can improve them, but they're either born to be a puncher or they're not. So on one hand, you see that. You see the truth of that, that you have that. You have a guy who was born to be a puncher. But then you also have that other side as a guy who has weaknesses. So that's how I saw it every day. I saw it the way you, again, you might not expect, where, yeah, I saw that if he touched you on top of the head, he would fracture your freaking ankles. But I also saw that his ankles were weak. If he didn't get his way, he would, he would go he would start to disintegrate. Mm. So I, I never could get, you could never get too high or too full of, you know, that feeling that, oh man, I got this guy. I remember giving an interview in that, did you ever see that documentary? Yeah, well anyway, it was a documentary done by Michael Martin. He did a good, he hung out for a couple months. Um, him and his, him and his uh, helper, 
Leslie Parks. They they hung out for a few months in Catskill, and they got permission from from us to and Cus to stay up there and film me in the gym every day for a while. And a lot of it again, it was around the kids that I was training, but it was around Tyson. And they followed us out to Colorado where we won the first nationals and all that stuff. <coughs> And uh, Watch Me Now, that was the name of it. Watch Me Now. Mm. So I remember giving all the way back then, how old was I? I don't know, 23 maybe, uh, 24. I gave this interview, and even then, I guess I understood, obviously. I, I told a story about how when we go to these tournaments now, I hear people saying, oh, you got that Tyson. He's got that Tyson. That's Teddy. He's got that Tyson. He's a natural. And the that was the, if it wasn't said directly, it was intimated. He's a natural. He's just got this guy who's a natural. He's a natural destroyer. He's got no fear. He's a monster. He, he, he could knock brick buildings down. He's a natural. And I remember, with no talk from Takas, nothing, just myself, I remember... When the interview was going on, I said to them, they don't know how wrong they are. I don't know if there's such a thing as a natural out there. I know that there's such a thing in my business as people that are born to punch. I get it. But a natural? I said, I don't have a natural. I don't see a natural. I see a great subject to work with. I see a great piece of clay, if you will, that's that can be molded into some kind of special, special, you know, being, if you will, spectacularly talented person to work with. But I don't see any natural. If it was natural, he wouldn't start falling apart when there was opposition, when there was something to overcome, when mm. there was resistance. He so wouldn't we, start uh, falling we're saying like uh, athletically and technically he picked things up very quickly but mentally when the path of resistance was there maybe he wasn't such a natural he not maybe get rid of that word uh, he wasn't okay <laughs> not maybe because and here's the here's the kicker that part is the most important part yeah <laughs> because the bricks, as I used the analogy earlier, are the bricks. Mm. But without the cement, they're just bricks. They're not bricks that stay in place when you walk on them, when you push them, when you punch them. And that was the part that needed to be there, the cement. And when people would say natural, it started to bother me. It actually would start to bother me to the point where I said it to Cus one day. I said, Cus, you know... We go there, it's almost like, it don't matter. Like, people think anyone could be, like, we just got to, we've, like, this guy was delivered in the middle of the night on a spaceship, <laughs> and the spaceship got out of there before anybody could take a picture of it. And and we all we have to do is go from place to place. With, and he laughed. We got to drive laughing. him. That's it, we're yeah. just driving him. Yeah, yeah. that's it, just drive him, all right? And <laughs> and get gas in the tank. And, and Cus started laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? He goes, you're getting annoyed. It's bothering you. I said, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And he goes, good, good. Now you know how important you are, he said. <sighs> and that's all that matters. That's, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if the other people know it. And he said, don't worry about it. So, and, and he was right. I remember I would say, you know, they, they don't know. And he would say, Teddy, listen. He, again, he was giving me something to keep me going. He said, look. That's your opposition out there. You're going to be very successful in this business. They don't understand these things that you are getting to understand. That, but that's your opposition. Don't try to educate them. <laughs> don't try to educate them. He was funny because he said, first of all, it's your opposition. You don't want to educate them. And second of all, if you try, you're going to drive yourself as crazy as they are. <laughs> he and you know he would give me something I remember kids when we were one of the national tournaments on the bus we'd get on the bus to go we would stay by ourselves we were like we were like alienated we were it was like me and him 
and then everyone else on the other part of the boat, like they they didn't even they were almost scared to sit next to us. And so we're on. And Tyson wasn't missed on Tyson. He kept that image. He knew it would help him. He knew that it would help him. So I remember. <laughs> Tyson would always have this stern look on his face. And and listen, me and Cuz probably promoted it, but he understood it instinctually on his own, you know? And he watched all the old-time fighters that we had the films of from Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton. So he he would keep, he would be like Jack Dempsey, like this one, like that one, you know? So this particular day, he would be like Sonny Liston. And that's sultry, that's serious, that's mean looking, you know, uh, that that image. So we're on the, it was the funniest thing, Brian. We're on the bus and you hear these kids, they're kids. <laughs> Meanwhile, I got, again, I got the natural. I, I got this monster, the monster. And, and they're all in the back and you hear them talking and whispering. And you can hear them. That's, and finally one of them says, that's Sonny Liston's nephew. <laughs> right there, we knew we won the tournament. <laughs> we won. We still had to go in there and throw punches, but the tournament was over. It was yeah. over, Brian. And 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 so here's the here's the great part of it. Tyson with this real serious look, like this, very mean, serious look. Not an accident. For a split second, he looked at me, and he went like this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just a little peek of a smile there like, you go we got him we yep. got him we got him teddy teddy i'm um obviously we 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 can see how close you are in those videos like you he really needed you there's just no doubt about it and as you've rightly described he he wasn't a natural and it, he was coached hard and long by you and um, and the other guys but i think the fact that that there was such a falling out it, it it must have been hard on you because these these guys who you coach you uh put blood sweat and tears into them you're giving up your time to build them into into as as cuz said to live their dreams and then one day um you're disconnected and it 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 all finished um can you sort of describe how that came about and how you were left feeling afterwards. I felt betrayed by, uh, it wasn't so strong with Tyson, it was with Cus. Really? Cus was my partner, he was my surrogate father, he was my um, he was my mentor, and um, I trusted him, he trusted me. We had a, we were working at the same thing together. I went up there, you gotta remember, he was retired, semi-retired, whatever, and um, there was nobody in the gym. We built something. I could say I built something. No, that would be wrong. We built something. We built something. We built something. You know, funny thing, Cuz would always say everyone's got to get tested. Fighters got to get tested. Women have to get tested. Friends have to get tested. All this stuff, right? He articulated that to me. Because you think somebody's... Uh, he told me a story. He goes, one time, he comes from the Bronx. He said, one time, guy, friend of his old friend from the Bronx came up to him, very upset. What are you upset about? And... He said, what am I upset? I'm upset that today I found out that my friend of 20 years uh, isn't my friend anymore. Cus looked at him and said, let me ask you a question. Yeah. How do you know he was ever your friend? What? 20, I just finished telling you, Cus. 20 years he's been my friend. Are you, didn't you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? How do you know he was ever your friend? Was there ever a test? Something uncomfortable? Something difficult? That he had to make a choice? Between you and that. And the guy looks at him and says, yeah, today. Because there it is. There it is. He was never your friend. Today was the first day you found out there was a test. Well, after all of that and all of that to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, there was a test finally. I don't know. I'm a kid, you know. I'm a young kid. But I'm still a, a person and put a lot of time in, and uh, he failed the test. If I go by everything he preached to me, everything he taught to me, he failed the test. That was the first time he was truly tested. Between staying with a future great fighter, possibly, 
but it looked like. And his last his last stand, so to speak, for Cos, he was getting older. Do you mean like that, his last chance at having a world champion for, like fight for him? Yeah, his last chance to have immortality. Cos mm. believed in immortality. Anyway, uh, it was to me that was the test. It was Cos. It was it represented more than just a fighter. It represented everything Cos did his whole life to come down to one last great fighter that he'll never be forgotten for. And he was right. And um, the only thing in the way of it at that point, after what happened with me and Tyson, was uh, me. And he made a choice. I get it, I'm older now, I understand, but at that moment, if you asked me to say, was I this forgiving or understanding or smart? No, I wasn't. I was angry, I was hurt, I was betrayed. You know, to me the most important thing in life is loyalty. Most important, I know there's other things too, but start with that. If you can be loyal, you can be strong. And if you can be strong, you can be other things. For me it starts with loyalty. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to be loyal. But there's also a lot of excuses not to be. And I thought Cus found an excuse not to be. He didn't pass the test, and it hurt me. And um, can I, I ask was, some questions about was, this? Because because I am a little bit confused. Because obviously people, all, yeah, people fall out, and people get become friends again, and people make up. So I'd, I I understand part of the story. And for those who don't know, if you don't mind me saying, Teddy, uh, from what I understand, there was a a, a, a relative. Um, I don't was it a relative of you or or Cus himself? No. Uh, it was a young I girl. Had, I had. It, it was my wife's sister. Okay. Okay. It was my sister-in-law. She was eleven years old. Right. And Tyson said something inappropriate to her. Put his which, hands on her too, but yeah, mm. he didn't rape her. He didn't rape her. He didn't, you know. But the suggestion was that it was going. He didn't sexually abuse her. You know. Again, uh -huh. you have a. You have to tell the truth. But um, but it was enough for me because he suggested that was coming. And, you know, being the man you were, you weren't going to stand for that back then, which makes perfect sense to me. I was not going to stand for it today either. I got yeah. news for you. But, exactly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> any age. I, I didn't get any better in that area. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, you, 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 found him um, and put a gun to his head and told him what the consequences would be if that ever happened again, which I think everyone out there can respect and knows that, you know, you were well within your rights to feel the way you felt and I don't think anyone would blame you, which is why it is confusing that it was you who left. And I guess the thing I've never, never known or never fully understood is why was that necessary? Was, was, were you an... Because have, have things been bubbling between you and Mike before that moment? Was he, was this a, a power play on his part or? Yeah, um, yeah, things were bubbling. Uh, he was testing me, testing boundaries. A young kid that came from where he came from, he was testing authority. Were you hard on him I, at times? Do you think that's well, why yeah, he wanted yeah, to push I was the a, buttons? I, I was a teacher and a teacher can be, as you said, soothing. I was his mentor, I was his I was his trainer, I was his teacher, I was his guide in this world mm. that he was get, trying to get to, and Cus was the supervisor. But I was the guy doing it. As you said, I was soothing, comforting, supporting, supportive when we won the Nationals in that uh, documentary clip, watch, uh, watch Me Now. But I was also, I told you, I didn't hide it. I, there was times I had to be somebody else. Yep. And I was becoming some, I was being called to be somebody else more and more as he started to stretch the boundaries of what he could stretch. Um, where he was in school, he's supposed to be in school, he's threatening teachers, he's telling them, you know, the teachers are telling him, get out of the lunchroom, uh, it was 10 in the morning, whatever, and go to class, and he's, throwing milk containers against the wall, 
towards them. Listen, he came from a tough area. I know it. He comes from a tough background. I get it. I understand it. But what, do you succumb to that? Or do you make him and let him succumb to that? Or do you make him get better than that? You wanted you to make him to, a man. Yeah, you do it the right way. But yeah. sometimes the right way isn't the sooth talking. It's a little stronger than that sometimes. And it's action. It's not talk. This kid is smart. He's got an innate intelligence of the street. He knows when you're not going to do nothing, when you're full of BS. And he knows when he's got the power. And he was starting to get the power because he was knocking guys out. So I put him out of the gym. I, I, I got his attention the only way I could. I put him out of the gym because of this behavior. And Cuss started to take control of things he never took control of before. All the incoming news, the, he got a relationship with the principal, vice principal, whoever the figure was at the school. And he talked to that. Cuss was, hey, he was convincing. Cuss was... Cuss was smart, and he told them, listen, this is a special kid. He can make this town famous, um, and he started giving them that stuff. Cuss had to do what he had to do for himself, too, to survive. I didn't see that coming at first. But but he's undermining your authority and then taking the the coaching power away from you, which will then make Mike lack respect for you. By yeah, doing listen, that. it became the bad cop, good cop. All right, mm. Cuss became the good cop. I became the bad cop. So I'm in the gym with him. I, I put him out of the gym. I explained to him, you got to learn how to control yourself outside the ring, not just inside the ring. Respect people. We're never going to have a success with you. If I allow you to continue down this path, uh, you, you can't do this. Out of the gym. And Cus started sneaking him in the gym. Cus never trained him. Cus never, Kevin Rooney never trained him. Now all of a sudden he's putting him in the gym behind my back with Kevin Rooney putting him through the, you know, the, the moves that he was taught already. Uh, because there was a tournament coming up. Cus didn't want him to miss the tournament. Whatever. That became very, that, that was the end right there. I mean, it took a little while to get there, but that was the end. So when, when Tyson saw that, this is a street kid that, recognizes strength and weakness better than most when he saw that he saw in the i didn't have to power no more he saw it i didn't i guess so i only had myself though i still had myself so he sees what cuss is undermining me whatever you want to call it and now he starts pushing the envelope because i'm the bad guy i put him out of the gym so he starts he starts doing this to my somebody in my family. It's not an accident. I I saw what he was doing. And um it led to what it led to. It you gotta understand one other part. He was a ward of the state. He came to us when he was twelve years old. He had already been arrested thirty times by the time he was eleven. And he was in Tryon. It's a juvenile detention center 30 miles outside of Albany, not far from us. And that's how we got him. We had a responsibility. The state had a responsibility. Put him with somebody responsible. Forget about the boxing part. We're as responsible as you can get when it comes to that. But put him with somebody who's going to help him become a better person. Help rehabilitate him, right? And part of that was going to school, getting along with people, developing you know, in a proper way. So there was a woman, Miss Coleman. I still remember her name. She was one of the caseworkers. There was, we took a picture with her. I still have the picture. And there was a few others. But Cus was very smart. So he's communicating with whoever it was. He makes a relationship. And she loves what she's hearing from him. She's getting articles when he's knocking guys out, winning tournaments. And it's, he's, she feels very good about it. What she's not getting is that he's already been thrown out of school for his behavior. And that Cuss made a relationship with the principal and, and a lot of things are not being reported. And they're not good things. She doesn't know, obviously, these things. And then it heads to where his trainer, can you imagine this? His trainer puts a gun to his head and listen, if you're going to say the story, you might as well say the whole truth. Um, no matter how it makes me look, 
It's okay. I know why he did it, and thank God we got past it, and I'm I'm thankful we got past it. But I, I pulled the trigger off in, in his ear to because I knew who I had. I had this kid that came from where he came from the streets that only believed one thing, one thing, not words. Action. And he tested, and he yes, and he tested you, yep. like Cus always talked about: test, 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 test. Well, he tested me. Yeah, is he really going to do this? Yeah, I'm going to do it. And I wanted him to know, not for me, but for him too, for both of us, because I knew it was going to wreck two lives. It was going to wreck my life, it was going to wreck my family's life, and it was going to wreck his, well, it was going to take his life away. And I understood that. Yeah, people are going to say, Teddy, why'd you do it then? Because I understood where it was going otherwise. So I'm not going to lie to you. I understood all of it. That's why I pulled the trigger. I wanted him to understand it. I didn't want to have to do it. That's why I did it. I wanted him to understand what was coming next, if there yeah. was a next. And there was only one thing coming. He, his, just darkness, never see me, and it's done. And I, didn't want, I, I wanted to save the two of us from that. So that's why I did it. And how did he react after you pulled the trigger in his ear? Like a guy that believed what I said. So anyway, can you imagine this woman, this agency? He's a ward of the state, right? Now you got to understand, Cuz was already making, Cuz is very smart. He was already making arrangements to adopt them. So he wouldn't have this hanging over his head, the state. But it was going to take time. It was a process. This could have screwed the whole thing up. If she ever found out that his trainer, who she saw these beautiful <laughs> pictures and images of, doing this <laughs> great job, <laughs> loving each other, <laughs> just freaking... Put a gun to his head. Yeah. It, it would have been all over. What would have happened in reality, they would have taken Tyson back and, you know, and put him, whatever, put him somewhere else, whatever. But uh, he wouldn't have been with Cus anymore or with me, obviously. Cus had to make a choice, and that choice did not include Teddy Atlas. It's that simple. I get where you're coming from, and you're right. Why would you have to leave? <laughs> Well, this, that was, there was reasons why I had to leave, obviously. So Cus it, had to it feels like it was maybe the right choice for you, though, given everything that you'd achieved and what you'd done at that point. And I guess, like you say, your, your apprenticeship maybe had been served. Yeah. But going, yeah, right. going on from there, that must have been tough for you, knowing that you'd give so much energy and effort to this kid who then goes on to become the youngest heavyweight champion of the world ever and achieving all these things. And maybe, you know, you deserved the credit for that back in the day and you weren't getting it. You know, I spent seven, maybe close to eight years, but let's say seven to, to be solid. Seven years were cost up there. Seven years. It's a long time. And, um, yeah, look, it was, it was what it was. There was, no other, there was no other real choice at that point. So I left. Yeah. You know what? I'm a stubborn son of a gun. I didn't leave right away. Uh, it was a dangerous situation. Tyson could come back. I have to do something. Whatever. You, you don't need me to paint the picture. But I stayed. Cuss stayed away. Shows you how serious I got. Cuss stayed away. Which, you know, he, he stayed away sometimes. But not now. He shouldn't have. But he stayed away. He got reports. <laughs> and I stayed for an extra week. You know why? I had seven kids that were still in a tournament up there in the Golden Gloves. And they had fought every week, you know, to get to the finals. And they were in the finals. They deserved me to finish this with them. Mm. Not for me to abandon them. I'll say it again. Not for me to abandon them. I'll say it again. Loyalty. Loyalty is a great word. It sounds great. But it's hard sometimes to be loyal. I was tested. I didn't want to be there another freaking second. 
with what could come in that door, everything else. But I had an obligation to these kids, young kids that were in the glove finals, to see them through. And I did. Five of them won the gloves. And then I left. And you know what the amazing thing about this whole thing is, Brian? These kids, quietly, they knew what was going on. They were in a small town, in the school, in the gym with, you know, Tyson, who's one of them. They knew what was going on. The last day in the gym, after they won the gloves, I, you know, I made them all come in so I could just say goodbye to them. They handed me a plaque. Like, where'd you get this plaque from? They knew all along what was going on. They handed me a plaque. It was really nice. Mm. Said, um, to Teddy Atlas, who's been our father, our guide, our mentor, thank you for helping us become men. And it was funny because I didn't realize that so much time had gone by. It takes different things sometimes to mark time, you know? Kind of like when you have a kid and you, and you put him against the wall and you mark where his head is with the pencil and then sometime later you put him there and you see that, yeah. <laughs> you know, you've seen he's grown and you didn't notice it because he was next to you, you know? And then you see it on a wall. I was, I, I walked home that night. I was living with my wife or we were about to have our first child. And um, so we were living in an apartment because I used to live at the house for all those years with, with Cus and Camille and a couple of fighters. Tyson was one of them. So I, I decided to walk home. It was a bit of a walk, but it was the right thing to do. I felt I wanted to walk. And these were little kids. These were 12-year-old, 11-year-old kids when, you know, when they came into my life. And they wrote those words, which was, you know, men. And all of a sudden I'm walking, all of a sudden a pickup truck pulls up. And I look, Teddy, you need a ride? And it's all these kids. And I said to myself, Jesus, they're driving. <laughs> <laughs> they're driving. They've grown up. Anyway, that was that was the end of that part. And then I, you know, took care of my family, took care of what I had to do, and then went, moved, packed up the truck, and moved to New York City <laughs> and uh, training fighters, finishing, well, uh, finishing what had to be finished, I guess. Well, I think it's lovely that you received that from those kids. I mean, it shows the impact that you had on them because a lot of people want to hear the Mike Tyson story, but... It's not just him. There's so many other people's lives that you've touched, clearly. And when, when they say making us men, it I think boxing is just so much bigger than getting in the ring and throwing punches, isn't it? It's it's and I know when you describe it, you always compare it to life and, and it's it, it's such a great metaphor for life and what it teaches you about how to so many different things about life from being in a in a boxing ring, which I don't think any other sport gives you. And it was nice to say recently that Mike uh, approached you and apologized um, and that you accepted. How did that make you feel in terms of potentially having closure over some painful wounds from years ago? Got to go back to some cuss that I hate to do it, but <laughs> it's all about the test if it's true, right? Yeah. I don't know. I didn't know how to feel except... I didn't know how to feel. I, again, I'd like to be that hero, that better person, and people say, wow, Teddy, that's so gracious and so kind of you and so heartwarming. Thank you, Teddy. But then if it's not all the way you felt, then you're not presenting the truth. Mm. And um, I was, I appreciated it, but I didn't know how real it was. I, I just didn't know. I didn't have the capacity to know. Maybe I'm not smart enough. I, I just didn't know because the cameras were rolling. Uh, I was doing an ESPN show up in upstate New York in the Turning Stone Casino, 
Indian casino up there where we would, mm-hmm. I was doing the Friday night fights, obviously the commentator for that. And it was a funny thing. It was a Mike Tyson pro, uh, production because he had become a, a, a promoter for a few minutes. You know, it didn't last that long, a year or so. I'm doing my job. I know he's in a building somewhere, but I'm not paying attention. I'm paying attention to being a professional, doing what I have to do. And then all of a sudden, my uh, producer, my beloved producer, <laughs> says, hey, Teddy, I don't want to throw off your concentration, um, but uh, Mike Tyson's walking towards you. Uh, what? <laughs> 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 Thanks, Robbie, for not throwing off my concentration. Mm-hmm. I love you, too. <laughs> you know? Was that the I first mean, time you'd like been in the same room since the confrontation? No. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. But it was the first time that we were uh, we were going to have conversation, as it turned out, mm. or, you know, have any kind of uh, actually coming to the point we of talking and what happened. So, so he tells me he's coming. He says, Teddy, I just got word. I don't want to try. And I'm like trying to be a pro. And I got somebody that last time, well, one of the last times we were together at least was not the best circumstances I think you could say, right? Yep. And, and so I, I'm i still me. He's still him. You know what I mean? You still got to, you still are who you are as far as the way you look at things. And even though we were many years past that, you would hope, right? And many, many, many things past that, right? And life past that. I still have to think, what does this mean? I don't know. My producer don't know. Just knows he's coming towards me right now. He hasn't gotten more, more information yet. And um, so I just, uh, I hit the mute button because you're allowed, to, you can do that. <laughs> and I turned to a guy I trust who was always with me sitting behind me, my man, who I used to do uh, the fight plan with. You remember the fight plan? We would mm-hmm. illustrate what was going to happen. And he's a former fighter, and, and he's my he's like my brother. I just said, let me know what shoulder he's approaching. <laughs> so I just want to know what side I got to be aware. Is it this side or this side? And let me just let me know when he's close so I'm ready. Just in case, God forbid, he wasn't coming with beautiful thoughts, which he was. Again, old habits, hard to break. Cuz told me you gotta test me, <laughs> gotta test them, gotta test them. So I'm aware, you know, a little bit now. And then, um, then uh, he apparently he stops behind me a, a, a bit of a distance. Not apparently, he did. And Robbie says to me, he wants permission to say sorry. He wants to be able to say sorry. I don't mean to make that sound like I'm giving him, I, I, I'm sorry if it sounded that way. I, I, I didn't mean, but he wants to make sure it's okay. He's being gracious. He's being a gentleman. He's being what you would want someone to be. Okay? Maybe he's being better than me. I don't know. Because I wasn't in that situation. I don't know if he's genuine, but I know that you got to give somebody a chance to find out if they're genuine. And it's, that's how I felt. And and I wasn't sure, but what I was sure of is if a man's going to come, it can't be the easiest thing for him either. If he's going to come, if, right or wrong, well, it's still not the easiest thing. Mm-hmm. And if he's going to come and he's doing it, there's two ways to look at it. Where's the sincerity if it's on TV? Why isn't it privately? But there's another side that I think I'm smart enough to understand, I hope. In some ways, that's even harder. That's even harder. And I I grabbed onto that, thankfully. Somebody upstairs must have helped this stubborn son of a gun understand that. Where, (laughs) because I probably wasn't smart enough myself. But I did understand it. For him to do that in front of people, that's even harder. My God. So if he's going to put his hand out and ask me to shake it, who the freak am I to say no? And so I turned around, and there he was. He came, he walked up, you know, and he's the best I can remember. You know, it's been some years, but he said, "Um, I'm sorry. 
And then he said the best thing, I think, in the world. And again, you don't know till you know, right? You don't know. But it was nice to hear it. He said, I love you. Oh, and um, that's nice. We shook hands and we gave each other a hug. And um, it was nice. I mean, it was nice. It was nice. I hope he's, people ask me, you know, they said, Teddy, blah, 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 blah. I said, listen, I just hope he's okay. I hope he's yeah. at peace. I hope he's in a good place. He was very honest about his feelings at, at certain times. You know, I knew things most people didn't know, but at certain times, you know, he was very honest where he didn't really like himself and he didn't trust people around him and he didn't feel they were around him. It's a tough thing on a person to feel that people are only around you because of what you can give them, not what they can give you, which is just loyalty, friendship, support, love. And and he was very he was smart he was always had a, a innate intelligence about him, and you know he he said it one time I remember I heard him say it one time, and um, I remember my wife who's smarter than I am she said what how does that make you feel to hear that because I I didn't try to hear too much of things that he would do over the years I'm not saying I ran from it but I I didn't look to hear it, and it was one sometimes it just happens and you hear it. And he was basically talking about he don't have no friends. He don't have nobody. And these people were kind of embarrassed because they were all at a press conference around him. <laughs> and he was, basically, <laughs> he was basically saying, I don't have no one I can trust. I don't have no friends. I got basically nothing but, you know, whatever that means. Leeches, yep. right? Mm. And and um, <laughs> I didn't, and she said, how does that make you feel hearing that? And I said, makes me feel a little bit of two things. And and I'm again. I don't care how it sounds. I care about it's how I felt. You tell the truth, or you keep your mouth shut. Yep. You don't try to satisfy people. You satisfy yourself. And I said to her, "This might sound small on my part, honey, but it makes <laughs> it makes me feel good to get those people to have those people have to hear that, to throw that right at them, to hear the truth about what they are." And and how little they are as people, and how unrespected they are as people. What they what what their actions have sold, what they really heard today, makes me feel kind of good, uh, and it makes me feel a little sad for him. And I, it's hard for me to feel sad for a guy that you know what happened happened with us, but mm. it made me feel sad for him. Because I never meant for him to... you got to remember, the genesis of our relationship was to become better, to become stronger, to become great, to become happy. Yeah. To become successful. That was the goal. That So, anyway, that was the story. Teddy, you're a, an amazing speaker. Uh, honestly, you are a truly amazing speaker. Um, so when I, uh, in, when I initially... Uh, set this interview up i had kind of planned to do a lot of the life story of teddy but there is just so much to cover so i'm thinking we'll kind of put that bit on pause and hopefully do a part two at some point to get the rise of your career and all of the coaching and all the the world champions and um if you don't mind we could do that down the road sometime sure um, of course and and for now i'd, I'd like to get your uh, take on some of the uh Few of the current events. Um, Anthony Joshua has basically admitted on a recent interview that he would potentially consider stepping aside, uh, taking a payment, and allowing Usyk and Fury to fight. I wondered what you made of that and what that tells you about where Anthony Joshua is. And I mean, uh, the old saying, you know, action is better than words. Mm. You can tell a lot about a person by their action and their decisions. Not so much always about their words. Words can be, you know, deceiving. Well, action it's interesting you'd say that, Teddy, because at the start of the interview, he kind of says, I wouldn't, uh, no, people know better than to offer me a step aside, my people. But then by the end of the video, he's, he's kind of saying, yeah, maybe I would actually. So... <laughs> Um, yeah. I don't know what I don't know if he even knows what he wants to do, but um, he definitely did. 
He didn't seem very confident. I mean, he to, knows to, what appeals to him the most. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, if I had to be a forecast of people's human nature, and I do have to be that in this business, mm -hmm. you got to know more than X's and O's. You got to know what a person feels. You got to know what they're inclined to do for the reasons they're inclined to do it. You got to know the human nature. You got to you got to understand human nature. You know, cuz used to say to me, "Okay, you're going to teach somebody to slip a punch." It's not a usually athletically uh re required movement where you have to have great abilities. You you slip from the waist up. A lot of people don't teach it right, but it should be one piece. Your head it should be like a metal rod goes down from your head to your waist and all one piece moves because some people move this way they leave the head on the side and you get clipped and they don't know why so you got to move the whole thing mm -hmm. one piece the whole thing and you and what you got to understand it's not about what you're doing it's what you're not doing you don't pull back you don't turn if you turn your head's still in the path to the punch you pull back you're still in the path to the punch so you have to control those things he said, it doesn't take athleticism to make that move. It takes discipline. It takes emotional control. It, it takes that kind of inner strength. It takes wanting to do it more than not wanting to do it. It, it takes, if you will, if you want to go that far, a lot of things, it, it takes a complete commitment of your character to just to get to the point where you can you know, look at something dangerous, face something dangerous, and not let it make you do what you feel like doing. You feel like pulling away. You feel like turning. You don't feel like staying right in the pocket, waiting for it, and doing that. You have to understand that as a trainer. So you have to understand when, it, when a man named Joshua says that, that's what he feels like doing. More than the other things that are required to maybe be great. It doesn't make him a bad guy. It doesn't make him a bad fighter. What it makes him is a guy who is limited to how great he can be. What it makes him is a guy that can't be what all maybe other people want him to be. We can't, you can't make someone be what you want him to be. I used to believe to a certain degree, with the will of strength of mind that I could put that into someone else when they're in a dire situation. And a dire situation is when you get in a ring. That's, that's a pretty tough situation, mm -hmm. facing what you have to face. The threat, the unknown, the imagination, the danger. And it, it's a difficult place to be put. And I used to think that I would, I got this from Cuss, that I, I would, just force my will into them. But you can't. They are what they are, and you can make them better by making them aware of things and giving them the tools, the wherewithal they need to deal with those things to the best of their ability, but they still have to want to deal with them. Because you used to say, people born round don't die square. <laughs> Uh, he he said, Teddy, you, you're going to try to change their nature. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with their nature. So you got to give them surrounding things to make their nature as fortified as possible for the things they're going to deal with. But you're still dealing with their nature. You know, you don't always need a polygraph test to to tell the truth. The truth comes at you in, in ways of action, you know. I I used to say when I was calling the fights on ESPN, right now, if there was a polygraph test going on, he this fighter would be telling you that he doesn't want to fight anymore. <laughs> you didn't need him to verbalize it. His actions verbalized it. Oh, the same thing to to you, Brian, to, the, to that question. I think his action verbalizes how he feels. What's most important to him, where his confidence is and stops, 
where it begins, where it ends, what's most important. One of the things I said on my podcast when I was breaking down his fight with... uh, Yusik. With Yusik in his last fight. And now this might sound mean, but I swear to you it's not mean. It's not meant to be mean. It's meant to be something that a person in the business as I've been almost 50 years is aware of. That's all. And I have to be aware of it because I have a responsibility to my fighters to be aware of it, to turn every stone over to give them the best chance to win, and every truth to fight off the things that are untruths. And the fighters don't always like that, but they need it. So when I watched that fight, the most telling thing to me was at the end, because right after that, to correct me if I'm wrong, I get my chronology messed up sometimes, but the the Wilder fight came after that, right? The Wilder... And, so, and, um, so um, and Fury fight, right? Yeah, yeah. So right? it was um, it was Usyk, uh, AJ first, first, and then Wilder yeah. Fury three yeah. after. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So after the Wilder fight, which I picked him to win, which my beautiful brothers and sisters over in the UK will remind me if I forget that. You know, I don't need a <laughs> chronology for that. They <laughs> they they love me. They're gonna remind me. Oh yeah, Teddy, you you definitely picked uh, Wilder, and um. One of the things that people knock Wilder for was the way he behaved afterwards. A sore loser, let's say. They, uh, and it wasn't appreciated. And people were, you know, they were, they were on him for that. And right, I get it. I get it. Rightfully so. Here's what I said. And I think this, in a nutshell, encapsulates what I'm, what I'm talking about here. After the fight with Usyk, I kind of wish, <laughs> if I was his trainer maybe, if I was involved in his future, that Joshua would be a little less of a good loser. Like, it, th- it, it, that he would behave like it mattered more. The greatest fight is, and the greatest successes in this world, one of the th- trademarks of them, for me, as they go about their next business, as if, No matter how much success they've had prior, they go about their next situation of whatever it is that brings them success as if their bank account is still at zero. Joshua behaved after that fight like his bank account is pretty far past zero. Pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. And uh, listen, again, he's a gentleman. He's a nice guy. He's, He's all of that. And he's made you people proud. But that was my answer. Mm. That I wish that he had a little bit of that sore loser like Wada does in him after a fight that's supposed to be so meaningful. So when I hear... it's so funny you would say that because in this interview, he literally stipulates his three things that he values the most. And he says, I want my respect. I want to be thought of as a throwback fighter who fought anyone. And last of all, I want to be known as a good businessman. And that good businessman thing, like it's only one thing out of the main three things. And yet the more he talked about it, the more he leaned towards, oh, well, maybe I would take the money. Maybe I would. You know what I mean? And it it just didn't fill me with that eye of the tiger confidence that you're looking for from an Englishman. I want him to win these fights, but it was just... It's not a good look, is it, when someone's talking about taking a payout instead of taking a rematch in a fight that he was schooled in, in the in the, in the original fight, you know? No, but what it is is the truth. You're not happy about it. Yep. Because it's not the truth you wanted to hear or that you hoped you would hear. Mm-hmm. But, but you got to give him credit for telling the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. Michael Jordan was a hell of a businessman. He owns half a Nike. But he would... Cut your freaking throat out, your your heart out on the floor, on that beautiful parquet floor, <laughs> in a second, to get another win. No, even though he owned there for Nike, yeah, it didn't matter. That's why Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan, and then there's other guys that are as talented. And this sounds like a far reach, but it's true. As talented as Michael Jordan, but there'll never be Michael Jordan because mm. it didn't matter. Winning didn't matter that much. And listen, sometimes maybe we get things out of perspective. 
Maybe we get things screwed up. Maybe we're wrong, Brian. You know, you got to be a family man. You got to be this. You got to be a businessman. You got to all those things. But we're not talking about that, are we? No, we're not. No, we're not. We're talking about what we want our guys to be. We want our guys to be everything that they're capable of being. We want to believe that's what they want. That they yeah. that they that they want it as much as we want it. That that we wanted them to say no. I got enough freaking money. And even if I didn't have enough money, there's something more important than money. I want that freaking title back. Yes. That's what we want them to be. We want them to be that. Yep. That that's how we stack up our heroes. That's how we stack up our, you know, the 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 people we maybe don't idolize. That's too strong a word, but that we connect with. That mm-hmm. that we are, want to repre- want representing us. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what we want. You guys play soccer. You have a big soccer. It's the world game. It's yeah. it's the universal game. And you got great soccer teams over there. You you want your soccer player when when he gets kicked in the shin and there's blood coming down and his freaking knee is twisted. You and there's mud on his face. You want him to freaking get up and yeah. freaking take that ball and take it down the field and put it in the freaking net. That's what you want. You don't want him saying, I, I, I can't play no more. I, I, I need a penalty kick. No, you just want him to want what you want. Yeah. Victory! You want him. You, it's it's, that, it's that, what that, you always say, Teddy. It's, I want him to behave like a fighter. You say that's that what a you lot. Want. And, I, and, and it really it, it lands with me because that's the thing with AJ in that first fight. When the fight was getting away from him, he seemed content to just allow that to happen and, and, and instead of risking it all to get it back. And that's the problem I've got right now with him. Listen, like him or not like him, I don't like the personality of Lada. I believe in telling the truth. I think that's becoming clear, even when it's to my uh, less than my betterment. Um, <laughs> but and it's what got me pushed away from uh, ESPN and corner fights because I told the truth about a fight in Australia against a guy named Jeff Horn and Pacquiao when I thought that uh, that Horn didn't win. Uh, yep. Okay, and and you pay the price for those things, and I'm willing to pay that price, no problem. It's okay. I'm not in love with it sometimes, but it's 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 part of uh, it's part of the deal. So. You know, you, you can't have both sometimes. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So I I don't love Wilder's personality, but I tell you what I do love about him. He didn't take the step aside money. He said, I want the freaking chance at the title. I want this guy. Mm. I want this guy who just freaking didn't beat him. He knocked him out. I'll say it again. He didn't beat him. He knocked him out. I want this. No, but you could get a few million dollars or how many other millions of dollars and, and you and you still could I want it now. I gotta admire that. That behavior. And the way he fought. He fought like yeah. a, a fighter should fight. He you gave know, everything no, and left it all fought, in there. He fought, like I said on my podcast, that's why I gave him a chance. He fought like a guy who was fighting for his identity. He was fighting for who he is and who he can be and who he's allowed to be. And who he can feel like, and who he would see. You know, it's an old, sometimes overused cliche. You, who do you see when you look in the mirror? I don't know, uh, unfortunately, today I don't think people see anything. They don't give a crap. Uh, they just see a beard, or they don't see a beard, and then they leave. And uh, if they see a beard, they put shaving cream on it. I, unfortunately, I don't think they freaking see what they should see, but. That's what Wilder was really... Sometimes those cliches come true. That's what Wilder was fighting for, Brian, that night. To see who the fuck was going to look back at him in the mirror. To see if he ever was a champion. He fought a lot of setups. Let's be honest. They all do. But he fought a lot of setups. <laughs> and, and he did. And then he finally, he finally fought a, a, a fighter. A complete fighter. And he had a draw. Some people didn't think he deserved it. Whatever. He had a draw. And then he got knocked out. So was he ever a champion? I'm being very serious right now. Was he ever a champion? He, he looks in that for himself. He's got to feel like it. Was I ever a champion? I beat him. When I had to fight, arguably the only real fight I ever had to fight. Okay, you could say Fort Ortiz. Ortiz was 40 years old. All right, I'll give you that. Okay, but the time he had to fight a guy in his prime, 
a good solid freaking fighter an undefeated fighter a guy who called wanted to be called what you're called a champion a guy who earned the wanted to earn the right to be called a champion behave like a guy who wanted to earn the right to be called a champion the first time you fight or the second time the first time you get a draw the second time you get knocked out He's not stupid. He has to live with himself before he's got to live with me or you or anybody else's thoughts or even with his bank account. He's got to walk down that street, look in that mirror and feel like he, who he earned to feel like. Did he earn the right to feel like a champion? That you could arguably say that the first time he was asked to fight like a champion and with the champion... And behave like a champion? He lost? Does he have to, was he ever a champion? Did he have the right to walk down and, and say, yeah, yeah, that's me, I'm the champ. Or that's the guy who knocked out 30 freaking guys that were doormen somewhere. And, and now he fights the, the real champion and he gets knocked out. No, he was fighting for his identity. That's more powerful than anything. He was fighting for the right to feel the way he wanted to feel the rest of his freaking life on this planet. He was real life movie. Sometimes movie stuff becomes reflective of real life. He was Rocky. He was Rocky in the movie. I know it's fictional, my beautiful brothers and sisters over there in the UK, but he was, he was Rocky when he was going to fight Club Lang and Mickey, his trainer, said, I don't want that fight. You're not fighting him. He'll knock you into tomorrow. What are you talking about? I'm a champion, Mickey. I beat all these guys. They were setups. They weren't real guys. They were setups. Yo, this guy had knocked your head off. He goes, What are you saying, Mickey? What are you saying? They were fixed fights? No, but they were hand picked. They weren't champions. Uh, so what so I was never a champion? I was never a champion? I was never a champion. So now Rocky had to freaking fight him. After getting his block knocked off, he had to fight him. What was he fighting him for? He wasn't fighting for a purse anymore. I guarantee you that. He had enough money. He wasn't fighting for a freaking title. He already had that. That's paper or whatever they make it of with these, these titles, these belts. <laughs> you want a belt? I'll get you a belt. No problem. So <laughs> he wasn't fighting. I'll get you one. I'll get you a couple of them. He wasn't fighting for that. He was fighting for himself. He was fighting for redemption. He was fighting to stay out of hell. Yeah, regret is hell. It's a solo prison that has bars, believe me. Isn't that the truth? He was fighting to freaking know who he was, who he ever was, who he ever was. And he was fighting for one last thing, to be what he wanted to be the rest of his life, to feel the way he needed to feel like a champion the rest of his life. That's what got him off the floor. That's what got him this freaking close to winning that fight by knockout when he dropped Fury twice. That's what allowed him to go where his body didn't want to go anymore, where his body almost couldn't go. He dragged his body to those late rounds. Dragged it. Dragged it. And you know why? Because of every word I just said. That's why. The only difference was he was in there with the same kind of guy. He was in there with the same kind of guy, the guy that looked at the devil and told him to get lost. The guy who looked at the devil in the eyes, making him think about taking his own life, which no man should ever think about. And he told the devil, get out of here. Get the F out of here. He was fighting that guy. And the guy who knew how to fight better. There's no disputing that. Cuss used to say to me, Teddy, it's a prerequisite. People say, oh, he's tough. He's dead. In our business, you better be tough. Otherwise, you better get another vocation. You better get another living. Go out on the street corner and freaking sell Italian ices somewhere. <laughs> all right? Really? Go ahead. <laughs> you better be tough. But Cuss would always say to me, you got two tough guys. And then one becomes smarter. He's smarter. He's better taught. He's got better technique. He's more together. He's more of the package. Boom. That guy becomes twice as tough. He becomes tougher. Mm -hmm. It's true. That's what we had that night. But everything I just described, that behavior, everything that I just put out there, Joshua 
I'm not knocking him. He's not driven by that. Yeah. I'm not saying everyone is. It's obvious that's what separates people and makes people special. But I'm not saying he's not a good fighter. But I am saying he's not that. He's not that. And um, he had it. You know, he he had his choice, and his choice is to do what he said: be a businessman, be smart, take the money, and okay, that's fine. But guess what? That shows up in the ring. It shows up. It, it, it doesn't get left. You don't say, oh, I'm business. Now I'm putting this hat on. I had my business hat. Now I'm putting my fighter's hat. I'll take it a step closer uh, farther, Brian. I'll put my championship special hat on right now. No, 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 no. It don't work that way. It's connected. It's connected. And it shows. Mm. And it showed already. And it has shown already. And that's why I tell you, you didn't, you know, I heard he's coming to the States and all that. I don't know if he made his decision yet to get another trainer. I don't know if that's, because I don't follow it as close as you might think, uh, somebody that's in the business. But, you know, I heard like everyone else that he was, he went over to, you know, see Canelo's training, went to see this guy, went to see that guy, um, you know, went to see a new tailor, um, you know, whatever, um, in, the, uh, in the States. We got good tailors over here too. <laughs> but, you know, but I, obviously right away people said, Teddy, Teddy, did he, did, he, did, he, did, he, did he come to see you or did he talk to you? No, uh, and nor should he. Why? I'm not that important. But I'll tell you one thing. The funny part was somebody said, if he did, ah, f- we shouldn't talk in if. No, no, but Teddy, if he did, if he did, um, and here you're gonna you're gonna well maybe you not that you don't understand where I'm at already but this kind of drives it home and this was somebody very close to me asking me the question I say who it was it was my son my son is the director of scouting for the Vegas Raiders my daughter I'm, I got two children I'm very blessed she's a lawyer he he does that. And it's not because of what they are professionally, it's what they are as people. Wow. I am so proud of them, I, I'm proud. He's a very smart, she's very smart, he's a very smart kid. And he's the only one who would ask a question like this. He said, Dad, Dad, I, I know he's not coming, I get it. He's never gonna ask you, uh, whatever, and you're retired now anyway. But I, just for me, because I already think I know the answer. And I think it's the opposite of what people would think they're gonna hear. But if you had your choice if between training him, if he did ask you, and training Wilder, who would you, very interesting, who would you take that? And without hesitation, and he just smiled, I, because I said, Wilder, I can't stand the guy, we don't like each other, <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like his personality. I don't like the way he conducts himself, the way he talks sometimes, but it's no contest. I like the way he behaves. I like the way he behaves in that freaking ring. I like the way that he puts it all on the line. I like the way he shows you where his cards are to the point where what he wants, what's important to him. I can work with that. The other guy, it would be much easier He's a he's a nice guy, probably maybe a nicer guy. I don't know, but but a guy you could get along with, and everything else. But he's not the guy that I want to be in a foxhole with. It it's funny that this kind of comes back the way you were sort of describing your issues with Mike Tyson. Is a lot of people spoke about Anthony Joshua in the exact same way. He's a natural. He's got it all: the speed, the agility, the power, the the reach, the size, everything. But when he's been tested by Andy Ruiz, and now obviously Usyk, did he pass those tests? And obviously he came back against Ruiz and fought him in a completely different way and, and all of that. But a lot of people weren't happy with how he behaved in the corner when he was getting beat up, when he didn't show the willingness that Tyson Fury showed. Um, and I guess now, for that reason, that is why you would pick Wilder, because of that lack of... Um, that certain aspect of a fighter. One one other question before I go, 
Uh, I love the fact that you're making MMA videos and I, and, 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 and your your take on MMA is, is great because you've got so much fighting knowledge from boxing and bringing it into the sport. And Dustin Poirier is, is um, a very good friend of yours and he recently gave an interview where he said that you sent him a bit of tape on Conor McGregor um, before the win uh, where you pointed out some things to, that, uh, and when you looked at how good Poirier's boxing looked at times and how he was catching McGregor with the check hook, I just wondered what it was you seen and, uh, and what you said in the video. I, again, we've been right. We're talking about the, gotta always be accurate, right? I mean, you, you sometimes you don't have to be. I didn't say it. You said it, so I could just leave it. Um, as being that it sounds better it sounds stronger so i could just leave it like that but <laughs> it, it wouldn't be exactly accurate i gave him a fight plan but not a video i talked about knowing what the guy is you got to know what the guy is what he is and what he is the guy's a great counter puncher don't give him counter punching opportunities it's not that complicated <laughs> um don't reach um use feints Get him to show his hand before you show yours. Uh, feint him. He wants to counter. Uh, get him off balance with a feint. Don't come in the front door. Counter punches need you to come in the front door. Come in the side door. Most important, understand range. Look, some people don't talk about with Connor. He's a tremendous counter puncher, great counter puncher. He's a pioneer in the sport. He's like Ali in some ways. People get crazy when I say it because his behavior hasn't always been good outside, whatever. But I got to give him credit where his credit's due. You know, give the devil's due. Uh, when Muhammad Ali brought the purses to a, to a level that the promoters never paid, McGregor has brought those purses to a place that never were before McGregor. And some fighters, some people say not enough, but listen, there's a lot of UFC fighters benefiting from from that because of him uh, as a pioneer in that way. He yes. was a great counter puncher, and he's a tremendous puncher with his left hand, the power punch for some southpaws where you could turn into it with your back leg and you could get your, your, your body into it. Um, but there's another aspect, and I made him very aware of this. His left hand is very long. He's got a long reach. That's what helped him be ahead. And I'll say it again. People get crazy. I was at the fight covering him for ESPN when he fought Mayweather. He was ahead, and he being McGregor after four rounds. Like it or not, yes, he was. He was smart. He was controlled. And he was using his reach, to the southpaw reach, to keep a counterpuncher from counterpunching. And he did it very well the first four rounds until Mayweather started to walk him down and get him into waters that were in his waters. He's got a long reach. It's hard to judge that until you're in the ring. And by then it's too late. Where that left hand goes maybe four inches longer than someone else's left hand would go. So where you're out of range with somebody else, you're still in range with Conor McGregor. Like I said, don't feed into the strengths of what are his strengths which is counterpunching, which means making mistakes, reaching in, being yeah. you know, being at the wrong distance, and bring him to the places where he's not in his wheelhouse, where he's not in his comfort zone. So that was there was other things, but that was that was the that was the crux of it. That was the basis of it. And listen, I was so happy he won. Well, Teddy, um, I'm I'm gonna wrap it there, but um, I just want to say I think the world of you, mate. I think you're a great guy. I think what you've done for boxing is amazing. I can't wait to talk to you again about the rest of your career. I love your channel. Love your podcast. I'm I'm a massive fan, and uh, I really Thank appreciate you. the time. Appreciate it. You your passion for boxing nobody comes close to it you are the most passionate guy about the sport and uh, the way you talk no one can compare so thanks for what you give us all as fans of the show and i look forward to watching you more and more mate thank you brian you're a gentleman uh you represent your people over there very well and give them my love I will do, mate. I'll tell them all. Teddy says hi. And not to hate on you if you ever pick against Tyson Fury again. <laughs> I don't think I ever pick against that guy again. It's going to be difficult. <laughs> I don't know. Right? But, but, but if there's one guy I would pick against him with, it 
well, there's already been a couple, so I, should, I gotta, I gotta fix that. Um, but if there was another guy, if I would go down that road a little further, it might be with Usyk because that man knows how to win. Absolutely, it could happen. I mean, that fight looks like it's going to happen now with Eddie Hearn uh, saying he, they're in talks to step aside. Now it could happen. So if the money's right, we might see that next. So uh, I'll keep in touch and I'll, I'll definitely uh, do this again sometime. If everyone wants to check out Teddy's podcast, the link will be in the description below. They do amazing fight videos, great interviews. I'm a huge fan. And thanks very much, Teddy. Appreciate you. Th th thank you, Brian. Appreciate you.